hey, good evening, and welcome to the Comics Experience Graphic Novel of the Month Club for the month of August 2022. Uh, the future, we love it. Um, we've we've got a great book uh, this month, um, uh, and and a, a pair of guests who have actually been here before uh, uh, many years ago. Uh, back, I think, in the first year of the club, um, uh, when they did uh, Four Kids Walk Into a Bank, and now we've got them returning for uh, What's the Furthest Place from Here, and we have Matthew Rosenberg and Tyler Boss, or maybe it's Tyler Boss and Matthew Rosenberg, depending on how you want to do it. Um, <laughs> we let you decide. That's, that's yeah. the joy of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very good. Well, welcome back. Um, how are you guys doing tonight? Uh, excellent. Thank you for having yeah. us. Thanks for having us again, Brian. It's good to know that we didn't screw it up the first time. Yeah, no, exactly. Well, it's a good book, to... you know, and you know, all you got to do is just keep making good books and I'll have you on all the time. It's, it's... <laughs> okay. We'll do it. We'll try. That's, it's not hard. I don't know. Maybe it is. Uh, so I'm going to probably ask you some of the same questions uh, that I, I did before, just, just because many years have passed and maybe your answers have changed or the way you think about it have changed. Uh, but my traditional first question, and I still love this question, why comics? Of, of all the ways that you could be doing things, making art, making being creative, you know, because comics, comics are not an easy mistress, I, I would say. Uh, and so, so they have to be special to you, I think, for you to, to, to make them your lover. Um, then wh why is this? Um, should I go first, Tyler? You want me to oh, you this? field it first, man? Yeah, I'll go first. Um, for me, I, I don't know that there was ever another option for me. I grew up um, in New York City across the street from a comic book store. I lived across the street from a comic book store. Um, it was the first place I was ever allowed to go. It was the first, it was, <laughs> I had an allowance and it was the only place that I could think of to spend money because it's the only place I knew that existed. Um, and I just fell in love with comics, you know, uh, stealing my older brother's comics when he would go out and, and they've just always had this sort of magical place for me. And there was all this stuff that, you know, uh, I wanted to do with my life. Um, but creatively, the only thing that I wanted to do was make comics. I wanted to make music, but I had, didn't have the discipline to learn how to be good at that. I could make bad music. Um, and then at a certain point, that just becomes non-reality. And uh, to me, comics was just that passion that never went away. And it was something that I, I love comics as much now as I did when I was five. And so yeah. trying to make them just seemed like a fun experiment. And then trying to make them became actually making them was a fun experiment. And then it became a way to make a living and do all these other things. But yeah. it, it, no other medium speaks to me like comics. Nothing else ever has. Like, I love TV. I love movies. I love music. I love all painting. But, like, comics just grabs me in a way that I, I, I can't escape. I think about comics all the time. I read comics all the time. I think it's sort of a perfect fusion of a lot of things that I love that nothing else quite gets to, if that makes sense. Yeah. No, 100%. 100%. Tyler, do you want to say the same question? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to give a different, or so it's a lot of the same stuff Matt sort of said, where it just, it wasn't even really a thought, you know what I mean? It just sort of was, it was just like when I was born, there was, I was reading the Sunday funnies as they would come. And, uh, my grandmother would bring me like seventies and eighties DC and Marvel, uh, comics from like flea markets and garage sales. She goes to, and it's just, it was the medium I've always interacted with the most. Um, and so it, it wasn't even like, it wasn't like a conscious decision. Um, really the, the more I think about it, there was like a conscious decision where, you know, I stopped reading comics for a little bit, like a lot of people do when you're like 13, 14 years old, you you start skateboarding, you start like playing a musical instrument, you start getting interested in, uh, romancing, um, you know, whoever you might want to romance and comics seem lame. Um, and then you turn 17 and you don't really care about being lame anymore. And you, uh, I think I was, uh, the, in the crappiest way, I think I was in my um, art, art class, uh, at 17 in high school. And my, I had this great teacher who would bring comic books into the class and we could pick him through and read them. And, um, I was reading, uh, I think an issue of, uh, Ed McGuinness's and maybe Jeff Loeb's Batman and Superman. I thought, yeah, I could probably do this for a living. Um, <laughs> as, as only the way that uh, jerk off seventeen year olds can uh, right. <laughs> have such hubris. Um, 
uh, turns out it's a lot harder than a uh, 17 year old me thought. Uh, yeah. Did you, did you go to art school to study comics at all, Tyler, or was it I just did, yeah, art I in general? To, I went to school of visual arts in New York city. Okay, so yeah. Study, yeah. Study comics with, um, mm -hmm. at the time my main teachers were David Sandlin and Nick Bertozzi, Gary Panner, mm -hmm. um, Klaus Jansen and David Mazzucchelli. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just those guys. Just those just, guys. <laughs> just those guys. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, what's the uh, what's the first uh, comic that you remember reading? Or maybe the better answer is, what's the first one that stuck with you? That like you're like, wow, my mind has been blown. I'm I'm like comics. <laughs> For me, I, I know what it was, and it was. Um taking my brothers uh it was the the dark phoenix issues of dark phoenix saga and i remember reading it and being so in love with the art and having literally no idea what was going on and just being <laughs> baffled and confused i didn't understand and i just kept being like i need to know more I, I need to know more of like this there must be a way to make this make sense and it took me being an adult and writing x-men comics to realize that it doesn't totally make sense ever but you know you you it, it, there is there's this just this sort of I, I i think especially that era of of comics i love you know i love a caption an editor's note caption box that tells you to go trace something down and like i you know i i don't want to be one of those people who pines and is romantic for like the pre-internet age but like there's something much more romantic, obviously, about having to go find long boxes to find the issue you need that answers your question instead of Wikipedia. Like that's just a better way to 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 become hooked is the the hunt, and the internet has destroyed the hunt. Um, but that for me, the the Dark Phoenix stuff was I, I was my I just could not. I wanted to know who everybody was. I wanted to know why these things were happening, and and I just never sort of shook that feeling like that that need to like just consume these things and find out more it, it's just really infectious in a, in, a, in the best possible way for me yeah yeah Patton Oswalt uh wrote a, a, a column maybe it was opinion piece of some kind about about the problems with everything available all of the time forever and yeah. how it makes weaker fans because you don't actually have to do any work if you can just go and get a thing and instantly read it and figure it out, you know, or go to Wikipedia and, and look it up. And so you think that you know things about something, but yeah. like that actual sort of hard earned, like tracking the books down or, you know, from when I was a kid, I certainly remember reading part one of stories all the time and not finding part two for 10 years or more. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah, that, I, that certainly doesn't happen as much these days. Yeah, you know, but my favorite, one of my favorite books when I was a kid was the the GI Joe, the Marvel GI Joe comics, and issue two of that book was just not something you could get. And yeah. I just forever was like, I don't know what happens in issue two. I I managed to go back and find every other issue, and then issue two was like forty bucks or something, and I was like, that's a that's four months of my allowance. I'm never gonna find out what happens in issue two. And I remember being like sixteen and getting it and being like. Oh yeah, just they didn't die. Okay, figured out. You know. <laughs> didn't die. <laughs> okay, good to know. Yeah. Would have been funnier if they had all died and been replaced yeah. by clones or something. Yeah. You know, like I just went with it. Just was like, oh, I missed that really important GI Joe moment. I guess it didn't matter, but yeah, no, it's uh, it, there is yeah, it feels like it feels like a weird thing to care about because it does feel a little bit like gatekeeping, and I love the accessibility, and I love you know, stores having things and, and being able to find trade paperbacks in print and all that. And I, I really do love that. And I rely on that because I'm not taking the time to dig in long boxes anymore. But it does feel like there is a missing piece that mattered to me. So I'm hoping that other fans are filling that piece in in other ways. And like in a similar way, like I talked about, I got all my comic books from flea markets and uh, garage sales that my grandma would get me when she would come and like babysit me and stuff. And she always was very thoughtful in that she would get me like the very first issue of a of a uh, a run or like you know the first couple. But there was a bunch of them that she got me where there was like one where it was uh, Dark Knight over Gotham, where she got me parts one and two, but never three. And so I still to this day have no idea how it ends because you get some at flea markets. It's not like I could go find them. Or this other one that really sh really shook me, where it's like this really nasty detective comics from the 80s where there's like a gang of kids going around Gotham making like 
snuff films, uh, like beating up people and, and filming it. And Batman's trying to shut them down. And the guy who's running this ring hires a big enforcer and he comes and he beats up Batman and the cover is Batman, like hanging with film strips, tying them up over like a void. And it was really evocative and nasty and mean and, and felt like I shouldn't be reading it at the age I read it. And I have no idea how it ends because my grandma only got me the first issue, but it starts that fun game when you're a kid of being like making up the story of what comes after that, like coming up with your own. It's almost like in a way that like some people come to writing or storytelling through fan fiction. It's, it's like a different thing where you start daydreaming. And I think that starts that like creative process of teaching yourself, like what it means to make up a story or become a storyteller in some way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, um, I also, you know, both of you guys are, you know, very strong on periodical comics and you're not trying to, th this didn't come out as an original graphic novel. No. Th this came out as, and it, it very much feels like a periodical comic. In fact, you know, my favorite quote here is this Brubaker one in the back where he's talking about how it's both nostalgic and shockingly new at the same time, which like really feels like this book to me a lot. Um, uh, so, so maybe talk about the power of, of the periodical. Oh man. Um, to me, it's, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm the biggest evangelist for single issue comics who barely read them. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I read so many. I mean, I, I don't say that as someone who doesn't read a lot of comics. I read about a trade paperback a night, a graphic novel a night. But I just I, I hit a point where my brain was frying from, you know, just stacks of books. And uh, I know a lot of people get there eventually where they're just like, I couldn't do this. But but for me, I think the periodical comic is is such a unique Lee. It, it's unique to any other medium. I, I think, you know, uh, people get a taste of it from maybe episodic television and the way episodic television works now of being hooked. But but the thing I love about a periodical comic is just the um, the idea of incrementally giving people something, the idea of giving things to people a piece at a time and the 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 joy of waiting and the anticipation and the breaks. There's something so amazingly rewarding about this the discipline you need to be a fan in that way and the and the reward of it of getting a new comic like i'm an adult christmas doesn't mean that much to me anymore but to me wednesdays or if you read dc comics tuesdays uh are, are like yeah sure um are are uh, uh you know uh, it's a Christmas. It's it's that thing you've been thinking about for a month coming to you. It's it's such a it's such a wonderful thing, and I I still get that in moments of waiting for you know the new trade paperback of something or like oh I can't wait for them to collect this. I can't wait for the new volume of Saga or whatever it is. But nothing will beat the the feeling of that that bite size dose of story that just leaves you on the edge of your seat. I mean, I there are so many things in comics that I love that are. So many of my favorite memories in comics are getting to the last page of an issue and being frustrated and being like, oh, no, I need to know. I need to know. Like, um, I always hold up like Robert Kirkman as one of the great writers because him and him and Brian K. Vaughan are, are, are two of my writing heroes because no matter what happens in the issue, you know, on the last page of that issue, you're going to put it down and be cursing the calendar that you have to wait a month. And that's yeah. such a good feeling. That's such yeah. a good only in comics feeling that I, 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 yeah, we chase that forever. And we want this book to be that we want to be making something that makes people on the edge of their seat for, for a month. Yeah. It's a little bit like um, the way we used to think about appointment television, right? Where, you know, uh, I guess the last um, real version of this we had was, was what, two or three years ago when game of Thrones was at its peak or whatever. And, people still every week would, would have a conversation about it and, and, and there was Reddit boards or whatever. And, 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 and the community that it fosters through like having that space between it, it makes it have a larger conversation with its audience. Whereas, you know, uh, uh, in the streaming model, if it all drops at once, how long is the conversation about that thing? It's, it's yeah. a week, two weeks, as opposed to, let's, you know, let's go on a ride together. Let's, let's make it, you know, like you can speculate, we can do these things. And it, it just opens you up to, you know, I, I love that 
um, streaming models have sort of switched even in their style where now it's they're back to putting out things once a week. Like, okay, we have 10 episodes. We're going to put it out once a week because I think it makes you as a reader or even me as a reader, I have to be more, um, I have to engage with it more. You know, I have to, it's okay. It's, it comes out now. I can sit down. I can, you know, I'm going to watch it. Uh, I have to debate with my wife, whether or not we're going to watch this series or this, like it's, I don't mm-hmm. know. It's, um, it just seems more, um, uh, blanking on the word, but more, uh, you're as a reader, or viewer, creator, you're just more engaged. There's a better word engaged. for it. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I think I think that's exactly what it is that you're that you're just more engaged because you're you have to wait, you have to think, you have to live in the space. So, okay, I mean, I I always say that one of the reasons that I think that comics are such a great medium are because of the gutter, right? Mm-hmm. Because of the space, but from one panel to another, where the reader has to figure out what happens in between those two things, yeah. right? That's a that's a piece of magic that that only comics have, right? I think that serialized fiction is the closest that other media can get to that model. Mm-hmm. Um, whether it's, you know, like a television show, we can say, but even sometimes movies, I, I don't know. Think about the end of... Uh, Back to the Future 2, right? Like, it ends in such a way that you're like, well, wait, wait, now I want to know what happens next, you know? I, w- I can't wait to see the next movie, you know? And you had to wait a year for it, but then you anticipated it, and you thought about it, and everybody walked into the theater with a theory of some kind, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I, I think also the your point about the gutter is really good. I, I sort of say the same thing, but about the sort of the synesthesia of, of sound, in, in comics and and sound effect and like what doesn't use sound effect and I, I always think all the time I watch certain things I'll watch a movie or a TV show and they'll play the perfect song and it gets you choked up and I'm always like that's cheating like you have to earn that like mm-hmm. like you know what uh, you know why the last man made me cry this much and they didn't have the, the perfect song they didn't have that crutch they didn't have you know these moments like we, rec- we, we were forced to create all those moments ourselves and forcing the audience to do it with, with the gutters, with the, with the sound effects in our minds, with all those things, with the voices of these characters. And so I feel like everything in comics in that way is sort of more earned. I feel like if you get the comic that makes you laugh out loud and it doesn't have the funny voice or the funny dramatic pause, like that's mm-hmm. a better joke than you're getting on a TV show or movie. Mm-hmm. You get that emotional moment. It's a better beat in a comic. If it hits you the same, that means the comic did it much better. Yeah, yeah, because because you're you're participating in it. Yeah, right. As the audience, right. Yeah. You're you, the the funny voice is there. It's just it's in your head. Exactly. Right. Like and and, and yeah, it's in the sp- in the space between. I I just I I don't know. I love I love that part of comics and the magic of comics that way, you know? Um, let's maybe talk about the origins of, of this. Where, where did, where did it start from? How did it, how did it come about? Sure. Um, yeah, I think, you know, me and Tyler did a book called four kids walking to a bank. We talked about, um, that did well and people seemed to like it and, um, we didn't hate each other at the end of it. So that was nice. And well, you know, most of us didn't hate the other one at the end of it. And we, you know, we immediately said, well, what are we doing next? What are we doing next? And we actually came up with something that we started working on that we felt really good about. And I, I hit a point, I hit a point about a day before Tyler, where I was like, this is four kids walking to a bank with an alien. Like, this is just the same book again. We're doing the same thing again. Mm -hmm. And the thing that we loved about four kids walking to a bank is that we were pushing ourselves and pushing each other really hard to try things that we weren't were out of our comfort zone and try to challenge each other as creators and doing the same book again but like in a different genre was exactly the opposite of the thing we liked the first time mm-hmm. so we threw that out and went to the drawing board back to the drawing board and i don't know if it was tyler or me but we we sort of came up with this idea that that four kids walking to a bank was a love letter to sort of all the stuff that we love in storytelling um, you know, it's sort of a certain type of comedy and, and heist movies and coming of age stories and, and crime stories and just all these things that we like. And we just crammed them together. And either Tyler or I, I don't know who, who came up with it, but it was like, let's do 
all the stuff that we love in storytelling that we didn't do. Let's do everything we left on the cutting room floor mm. as a book. So whereas Four Kids Walking to a Bank was a tight contained story with a definite, you know, with a small cast and a, uh, and like definite, you know, formalism. You, a lot of formalism and you knew what the, what the story was from the title of the book. I mean, like the title of the book is very much uh, lays everything out. I was like, let's do the opposite or, you know, like let's, let's, to big sprawling epic ensemble cast ongoing book that 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 obscures things and doesn't answer all your questions and has mystery and has sci-fi and has horror and has fantasy elements and so it's all these things that we love that we didn't get to play with last time and it's all these things that we don't feel comfortable doing again it's the you know the ongoing like doing an ongoing indie comic is terrifying and like you know we have to earn the end of this book and that was something that we were both really scared of and so we wanted to do it because we want to do things that make us scared to make them and and that's the only rewarding way to do it so that's the real behind the scenes origin of the book um as for what it actually is i don't really uh it was just an idea that that we had kicking around of you know kids in a post-apocalyptic world with no adults and what that would be and um yeah. it sort of spun from there yeah tyler did you have anything you wanted to add to sort of the behind um, the scenes the beginning parts uh i mean it, this is actually kind of the exact opposite of the beginning but in the way matt talked about it where we're kind of going sprawling it's ongoing what's really fun about that um is like <laughs> there's a lot more room to in the way that like four kids was very tight and so like we could do a lot of like fun different styles of jokes that only comics could do, whether it's like, you know, doing the onomatopoeia as like the effect is a, like if somebody's vomiting, it says font to a ball mm -hmm. hitting somebody in throwing position, like different jokes like that. Um, doing this long form, there's like moments where we're coming up with things that like, since we know the, every place we're going, but we don't know exactly who's there yet, we get the chance to do that. And I made my new favorite character ever yesterday, who's, um, I don't know what he is. He's like a weird little trash can robot man. I don't know if he's a robot. I don't know if he's a Jawa. He's in two panels. You'll never see him again. But oh, he would have never like existed. Him. He would have never have existed if not for doing an ongoing format. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the exploration is a big thing for us of like, we're, we're on this journey too. We actually had, had a bunch of, I mean, I probably shouldn't talk about them, but we had a bunch of calls with TV film people the past few days and, uh, you know, there's parts of this where where we're like, we're not we're not good at the TV film thing because we don't sit down and hand you a like this is the roadmap of where this is this is and we're going to these meetings being like yeah this would be really fucking hard to make as a TV show or a film sorry like this is really and and part of that is like we're exploring we're figuring things out we know what the end is we've always known what the end of this book is. Um, and we know what all the middle parts are but how they connect and how they fit and who's there we don't have because we are learning as we go what works and what feels right and that's really sort of the why we're still invigorated on this book even though we're working on issues 10 11 12 right now um, yeah so so when you guys were conceiving this did you had you conceived of that ending right from the jump or did that come sort of as you were developing it we always start sort of like and it, we, we always know, like even with four kids, it's we know how it's going to end. We kind of know where we want to start. And then with this one in particular, it's like it's almost like if you think about it as like a road trip, it's like we have these stops we have to hit along the way, like the world's largest shoe. But we don't know who's exactly going to be at the world's largest shoe is yeah. the like the sort of so it's like and and there's obviously since we know we have to go from here to here certain people will eventually have to be in certain different areas, but it's like, um, it's, it's like that idea of um, writing as a garden, you know, you sort of plant these different seeds and you watch it grow as opposed to, um, I forget the other, it's, there's two, what is it? It's garden and something else uh, for different ways of writing. Parking lot. Yeah. Parking, parking lot. lot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> no. Yeah. I think, I think the, uh, for me, uh, on these kinds of things. I, it was drilled to me in a very young age. My, my dad was a writer um, who read comics as a kid, 
and started to not like com didn't like comics as an adult. He grew out of it. And mm -hmm. I loved comics. And he, when I was little, he was like, yeah, he's reading. It's fine. And at a certain point he was like, just read a book. And I was like, these are books. Um, and it was an ongoing fight with my dad. But he said to me when I was very little, he said, you know, I was reading Spider-Man or whatever, not that little, but like, you know, probably a teenager. He was like, these aren't stories. And I was like, what does that mean? Of course they're stories. And my dad had this definition of a story that he drilled into me, which was uh, the curtain goes up and you meet a character. When the curtain goes down, that character has changed. That's what a story is. And he said, how is Peter Parker of your life inherently a different character than Peter Parker of my life? You're not reading a story. And it's a very myopic view of storytelling. And, it, and I don't think it appreciates the, the beauty of what, you know, the, the big two comic storytelling is. But, and I, 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 I think I, I helped him understand that and, and, and sort of the beauty of, of a different kind of story and a different kind of experience in storytelling. But with that said, that motto of the curtain comes up, you meet a character. When the curtain comes down, it's a different character. Um, that is built into me <laughs> from go. So I can't start working on something without knowing where it ends, what, what, what we're looking at and what we're dealing with when the curtain comes down. I, I've had to do it at Marvel. I've had to do it at DC and it feels, you know, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but on an indie comic, I could never do that. And I think Tyler's brain works the same way that like we're, we're driving towards a point and a goal and without knowing what that point or goal is like i don't know why you start the car yeah yeah you you, you agree with that uh assessment tyler yeah 100 percent. it's um i think that that's a, a pretty um i wouldn't say a rule in the, but it's it's a big reason why i think me and that work together so well as we sort of approach storytelling in a very similar way um where you know i, I a lot of people view their have different working and creative uh, relationships, but mine and Matt's is very, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a thing where people ask, like, they'll attribute an idea to me that Matt came up with, or they'll attribute an idea that, uh, to Matt that, I, you know, vice versa. And it's, um, it's hard, like, we don't even normally remember which one of us came up with what bit mm -hmm. in a thing. Cause the way, I mean, like, sure. I got to sit down and draw the physical thing, but like Matt is so, detailed in his scripts about um you know what's sort of going on panel to panel page to page and and you know when we're breaking story together it's us sitting in a room being like well you know these are the interactions that we need to have these are you know phone yeah. calls till three in the morning coming up with it so yeah mm -hmm. um, i mean I, our plan is basically every you know six months we, we get together and spend three or four days being like let's figure out what the next six months of comics looks like for us because yeah. just having that one document i mean the, the, again that goes back to the the joy of the periodical is like finding out who responds to what and being like oh this matters to me. and it's not so much about audience feedback or reading reviews but just seeing what clicks with people and what they gravitate towards and and what and and us learning to care about different things like different characters have become more prominent in the book as the book comes out where we're like we actually really like spending time with this character yeah. they're going to do more and this character is going to do less and and i think that's really the joy of of making a periodical versus a graphic novel like the that you're at the end of the day it's a living it's a living document it's a living yeah. project as we go yeah. and and so i hope that people are you know realizing that that we're on the same journey as they are when they read it I, I wonder how the um, uh, how the sort of that six month check in process has changed for you guys over the last year as you've you know you're you're well into the second arc you may even be into the third arc of, of the book at this point um, I, I'm not quite sure where you're where you're at it's, it's from, a confusing, from your it's a point of view structure. yeah yeah it's yeah. a confusing structure yeah but I think yeah. I think we have basically figured out up to issue. 18 okay. maybe 17 uh, 19, 19 19 yeah yeah like we yeah. have we know we know what each one of those issues is yeah yeah so so do do your conversations about like have they gotten more detailed or or less because you're more comfortable uh working with each other and you sort of can finish each other's sentences or I, you know, I don't think that uh, they don't get more or less detailed. I mean, we've known each other. We used to work together in a comic shop. 
we've known each other for a really long time. Um, so like I, 2011. 2000, yeah, we've been friends for 11 years or whatever. So like, there's not a- Which hurts my heart to not remember our anniversary, but. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's all right. Uh, what's, what's the 11th anniversary? What is that, paper? I'm gonna say paper. Sure. Um, wood. Wood, I'll get you something nice that's wood. Um, the, no, but I think it's not about, there's not a level of comfort we have creatively. There is a level of comfort we have with the world that we didn't used to have. That like now there's less, uh, there was a lot of early on us being like, can we do this? And like both of us having these things of like, how far can we push this, the world building and the stories mm -hmm. and the characters? And mm -hmm. now we sort of realize that like, there's very few things that were, there's things that we didn't do where we were like, that doesn't fit. But I don't think there's anything we've walked back because we thought we couldn't do it. So like it, the world is going to continue and the characters are going to continue to expand and, and have these crazy twists and moments that I think people really seem to like. But there's nothing that we we have a fear, more of a fearlessness about it now than we have yeah. before. Yeah. I, I also meant it in terms of just your ability to to work together and to communicate the ideas to each other, mm -hmm. you know. Because certainly one of the things I've I've heard from other long running teams is that it gets easier and harder at the same time. But it gets easier as you go along because you don't have to explain everything. They yeah. they they know where you're coming from. You know, once once you've yeah. done four hundred pages together, it becomes easier. You know. Yeah, it definitely is. It's that certain when you I think you said earlier too, like finishing each other's sentences. There's a sort of thing where it's like one of us will say like, oh, this character needs to do this. And then the other person will be like, yeah, of course, because then they're going to do this. And then it just ping pongs yeah. back and forth and like, we'll be, you know, or sometimes it'll be a thing where one of us feels like, yeah, and then this has to happen. The other person will go, that's moronic. Absolutely not. Yeah. That person will go, oh, you're right. Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> so and, that, does... and that's important. That's super important because I feel like there was a time when both of us would have bad ideas and we'd tiptoe around that. And now we don't right. have to, where I can just be like, yeah, that's like... stupid. Tyler will just be like, that's dumb. Like, we should never do that. And I don't really, you know, like I, there's a lot of times, you know, where I'll send him an idea and he'll just be like, I don't want to draw that. That sucks. And I'll be like, okay, or he'll draw something and I'll just be like, you know, like, or he'll, he'll have some idea and I'll be like, I don't get that at all. And I'll be like, okay. And we just move on. Um, yeah. And I, you know, that, that's super helpful to not have, uh, we're, we know we respect each other enough that we don't have to be delicate with each other. Yeah. Can you, can you contrast, this working relationship with the working relationship that you might have with a penciler for hire on a, on a work for hire book and not, not to, not to make one better than the other, but it seems to me that there, there might be differences in, in the method of working. Sure. Sure. I mean, for me, it's always funny because I used to voraciously, when I was starting to try and make comics, I would voraciously read interviews with writers I loved. And a lot of times they'd be asked like, well, what's the difference between a, a creator owned book and a, a work for hire book? And they'd always be like, oh, it's totally different. They're a totally different process. And I was always laugh and be like, what a pretentious answer. Like you're just writing, like stop. Um, it is a totally different process. Of course, the people who did the job knew what they were talking about. And the guy who wanted to do the job had no idea. Surprise, surprise. Um, but it is, it, it, there is more nuance to it than that because the relationships are very, every relationship is different. So like there are people I've worked with at uh, Marvel and DC who, you know, immediately I'm, you know, we just click and, and I have a great relationship with them. And there are people who I work with who I've never exchanged an email with, like yeah. where I'm just like, yeah, I wrote a script and he drew it. Like, I don't, yeah. you know, I don't want to like, and, and that's fine. Like that's the job for some of them. Uh, for me and Tyler, it feels different in only that like, I don't think of myself as the writer of this book, particularly. I think of it as like me and Tyler made a thing and I don't, it doesn't break down. Like I don't ever think that I drew it, but, but I, I, I think of it as much as Tyler's as mine. Whereas in, in a, that is not a situation I find myself in a lot. Um, but I think that comes from not just the work for hire relationship, but just also the relationship we have where we're so on the same page where like we know each other's influences. We know each other's dislikes in a certain way. Um, but I don't know, like Tyler can speak to it. Like Tyler's drawn a bunch of books with other people too. Like, do you sure. feel? Uh, I think I've drawn exactly two books with other people. That's definitely two single not, issues. That's not correct. <laughs> it is. No, 
No, you did Department of Truth. You did Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. You did the last podcast on the left. Oh, that's I did that by myself. No, you didn't. You just did. Oh, I I guess I did do I did do eight pages with James, but I also did ten pages by myself. Um, But yeah, I mean, it's definitely. I mean, when I worked with um, uh, Paul Aller on an issue of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, um, Paul was great in the sense that he found out I was going to be drawing it, so he sort of tailored his script um, to me. So it was sort of, it had a lot of the same elements that he saw in, the, in Four Kids Walk Into a Bank um, was was already in the, in the script of like, you know, you could do something cool with the page here, or, you know, we could do some, like something different here. Um, and I didn't realize this is weird um, until Matt told me this, but I don't send, I, I send finished pages. I don't send thumbnails. I don't send pencils. Mm-hmm. I don't send ink. I just send people finished pages and I don't do edits. And apparently that's a real jerk move. <laughs> yeah, so, it's not great. Not great. Um, uh, luckily, Paul and and James, uh, all, they just have always sent back a thumbs up. Great job. Uh, so I've been very lucky that the other two writers I've worked with um, didn't call me out for being a jerk. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess I guess when you when you're primarily working on creator owned work, you don't really have to show it to anybody else. To get approval, yeah, right? I, yeah, yeah it's, it was that thing. Even when I did, um, I did a book at Dark Horse called Dead Dogs Bite, and I, I did everything on that one. Wrote Drew Letter, and I would just, it was, I didn't even, like, I, I think I sent him scripts for the first two issues, and then I kind of just stopped even doing that <laughs> and just sent in finished <laughs> issues, <laughs> which was, I mean, it, it, I don't know. It seems, it seemed like it would save everyone a lot of effort. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh-huh. But it also is a is a huge assumption of ego that they're any good from start to finish. I mean, it's it's funny though because I feel like some of that is like our bad habits on each other. Because I I write very detailed scripts as as you said before, Tyler. But my feeling and how I start every relationship with an artist is I say like I write a long detailed script because that's how I see it in my head, and I it's just easier for me to put it down and visualize the page and, and what works. Like, I'm, I'm visualizing an actual comic page in my head and describing it to you. And I said, but once I hand you the script, it's your book. I don't care if you throw all of this out. Like, you know, this is the story, and try and stick to that, and we'll make it work. But for the most part, like, my feeling is once the script leaves my outbox and ends in an editor or an artist's inbox, it's someone else's book to do with as they see... Pl- and, and then it comes back to me. And if they've changed a lot of stuff, I have to retailer my script to fit that. But I, that's my view on collaboration is like, I put my all on the page. Now you do the same, not you take what I did and expand on it. So like, I'm not a big person who gives notes when I work with artists. I'm like, if that's how you want it to look, that's how it's going to look. Like the, the only time I ever give notes is if there's something that I'm like, that contradicts something that we need to happen or contra or is a mistake a visual mistake of some sort but like i don't ever you know if you put a guy who wasn't supposed to be talking in the panel i guess that guy's talking now and i'll figure it out like (laughs) it's it's uh and and so that's why me and tyler work well together because if he did send me roughs i'd be like yeah sure (laughs) like i don't i I don't i I look at them (laughs) but i don't if that's what he yeah. thinks it should look like. That's what it should look so, like. But but in the in the mainstream comic space, in the work for hire space, you're you're typically you're going to write a script, you're going to give it to an editor, an editor's going to then make changes and come back to you as the writer with here's the stuff that I, you know, here's my notes. Yes. Right. And then you theoretically will be doing a second second draft. Yeah. I mean, Is yeah. That- I mean, I always. Uh... I think I would like to think that my editors would back me up on this, that I, I pretty much, you know, like a lot of the times when you work at a, at a big two at at a corporate comic, um, a lot of the notes are, are not just story notes, but they're also like brand upkeep notes. They're, you know, you can't have Batman kick a kid in the head, kick a small child in the head for no reason, you know, whatever it is. Like you gotta have a reason why he's kicking that small child. He he has to hate that kid. Um, (laughs) No, but you know, like there, there are rules. And so a lot of the notes are just like, this can't happen because of this, this can't happen. You know, you're contradicting this thing or, or we're setting up a thing with this here. Um, There's a crossover that's happening that you didn't know about that I'm going to tell you about now. Exactly. Like, yeah, like, yeah, that guy's dead. So he really can't be in this comic. I get that guy's dead a lot in my notes. We're like, you wrote this guy and he's dead. Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, so those notes, like, there's no reason to argue them or push back on them. And then the other note, the other kind of notes, like, 
those come with trusting an editor. And I've worked with a lot of really good editors. I've worked with some bad editors and there have been a couple fights. Um, you know, the, but also with a lot of good editors have had notes I would disagree with and there's been long calls. But at the end of the day, like, I'm pretty amenable to notes. Like, if you want to note it, we'll note it. We'll like, I'll make it work one way. We'll compromise in some way and I'll make it work is sort of my feeling. I know a lot of writers who kick and scream on notes and, and fight back and I'm like, it's, their name's on the book too. Like, let's make it work. That's sort of sure. my feeling. I, 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 let me ask you this. And I don't, I don't know how you're, if you're going to be able to answer it just because of the nature of the question. But do you, do you feel like there are a lot of editors at, at particularly at the big two who, who actually understand comics, like the language of comics, as opposed to the brand management part of it. Because from my side of the table and not interacting with them, you know, in a creative fashion, it really strikes me that most editors are more about traffic management this, these days and brand management than they are about making sure that it's the best 22 pages that it possibly can be. Um. I mean, it's complicated. I definitely have had editors who I've worked with where I thought, like, you're not trying to make a good book. You're trying to make a book that makes sure that none of us get in trouble. Mm -hmm. um, and that goes in a lot of ways. That goes to corporate overlords and that goes to getting yelled at on Twitter. And it goes yeah. towards, you know, another writer being like, but that's the character from my book. And they did this thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of editing, I don't enjoy. Um, I don't mind getting yelled at as much as I mind sort of making a book that has no point of view. Um, mm -hmm. I would rather get yelled at from a bunch of people. I don't love getting yelled at, but like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, good art gets yelled at for sure. So like, I don't, I don't take it as a mark that I've failed when I get yelled at. Um, sometimes I have, <laughs> but often not, uh, or sometimes not, but no, I think, I think there's both kinds of editors. Um, I've been very lucky. My editors at DC, I've only worked with a few editors at DC and they are as smart and passionate about the comics and the stories as anyone I've ever met in this business. Um, mm -hmm. Ben Abernathy, Dave Welgis, Paul Kaminsky, those guys, uh, their passion for this stuff, like, you know, uh, Ben Abernathy, who is the executive editor at DC and the head of the Batman group, texts me at 11 o'clock at night with a like, you know, it'd be cool in the Joker book. Like, that's mm -hmm. not someone doing brand management. That's someone mm -hmm. who wants to make cool things. And mm -hmm. that is so infectious and inspiring. And I've, I've had that, you know, at Marvel too, like Jake Thomas and uh, Will Moss and Darren Chan and a, bun a bunch of editors I've worked with are, are, are super, Alana Smith, are super passionate about making good books. But I think it's very easy to have the books. It's very easy to, to drop a book into one category or the other. And, and so there are definitely always going to be some books where you're like, we're putting this out and let's just try not to ruffle any feathers and make a thing that's easy and out there. So you're going to get those. And I don't think that's necessarily on an editor's head as much as a corporate mandate's head. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I, when I was coming up, I was told very early that like your job as a writer, uh, editors are, are shepherding, you know, three, four, five, six, eight projects. And they usually have one that has some real heavyweight talent on it. And that mm -hmm. one is going to take 90% of their time. They're going to be fighting to get scripts out of big name writers. They're going to be fighting to get pages out of big name artists. Your job is to make sure that there is no headache at all coming from you and your team. Mm -hmm. And I think that sort of idea, and that's always stuck with me of just like, how do I make everyone's jobs easier? Like that's sort of my job is to just make the machine run well. And I think that that idea spills over in a bunch of ways. I think that spills over into the, the work they make as well, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it does. Looks looks like we lost Tyler there for a second. Uh, I'm sure Tyler will be back. Um, uh, yeah, I. Um, what what's the most number of books that you've written concurrently? Would you say? Uh, like you know, having live projects kind of juggling at the same time between the two companies and your and your creator own work. Uh, eight titles a month. Wow! Wow! It's awful. It's awful. Um, yeah. I, I, I don't like being there. There are a lot of people who, who cry, oh, woe is me. I have my dream job. And I don't like being that. But I, <laughs> I, I love my job and I'm happy to do it, you know. Um, but that doing, doing a certain number of books means that 
you're not watching a television show. Like you're eating all your meals at your computer. You're waking up and answering emails and you're working 14 hour days, 16 hour days, and then seven days a week. You know, there, I, I've done a lot of hundred hour months, a hundred hour weeks on, on Welcome project. Sorry about that. Yes. That's my cat. No, it's all good. Um, unplugged my router. Huh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Cats. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I think that there's a, there's a, there's a, a love affair in this industry of, of working too hard, and, um, you know, I, I think when you look at a lot of the great like manga masters, the, especially the older generation, sort of warn about that of like, we're driving our creators into the grave by the workloads, and I see that in, in myself and my friends that it's like, like, yeah, you can work too many hours, and it's, it takes a toll. Um, yeah, you know, but uh, I'm working too many hours now. But uh, it's also like, well, I love the job, and they dangle things in front of you that you're like, well, of course I want to do this. Like, uh, yeah. you know, I, I I was getting down to a healthy number of projects, and then they were like, Wildcats is greenlit, and I was like, well, Wildcats is the book that I've been trying to do yeah. uh, forever. It's like it's a property I love so much. So like, yeah, let's let's you know, guess I'm not going on vacation. I'm doing Wildcats and that. Kind yeah. Of so yeah, I uh, I I'm. I'm mostly worried these days about um, about the young kids who are coming out of the the colleges, you know, the the comics colleges, and they're being handed contracts for 200 page graphic novels, you know, right. and and they've and they've never done 12 contiguous pages in their life, you know, um, and I I sometimes wonder, you know, that there's a huge burden on these people to create in a certain way. But they're probably not working even for minimum wage on on that initial, oh, you sure. know, rate from that contract. You know, so I, I I like sometimes I think the comics is a game for the young. You know, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know I, where I was going with that necessarily. No, I you know I I'm my brother's a writer and and uh, a screenwriter and he's made movies and TV and we're gonna do a comic together. Um, just because we want to work on something together. And, and I, I had to explain to him, I was like, you understand, like, I was like, the artist is going to start on this day. And I was like, the train then is rolling. The train is leaving the station. And I was like, our job is just to have track in front of it. And when yeah. it doesn't have track in front of it, he doesn't get to eat that week. He doesn't get, yeah. he doesn't get like, he's not on like hobby time. He's unemployed. And I was like, so no matter what, the train is rolling and and like it, it really dawned on him in this funny way of like what my job is of just like yeah it's it's just keeping i mean the term we use in corporate comics is keeping artists fed like you're yeah. just making sure you're keeping them fed no matter what and that sometimes yeah. means that you're writing three pages at three in the morning so to get them through the next two days and then you can have the rest of the script but you're just trying to buy yourself breathing room um it's a very weird job uh, it's not, it's definitely not for everyone. It's definitely not, uh, Olive, it's definitely not conducive to, uh, making the best work and it's not the best working conditions, but it is the industry that we're in. So, yeah. How is, how is it different with, with a creator owned book, uh, like this? Are is, is the track longer or, or does Tyler have more of the track himself? Uh, you see what I mean? Yeah. Um, I think that. Uh, you know, Tyler, you can speak to that a little bit, but the, uh, if Olive... Oh, it's losing her mind. Our editor, Olive, is currently <laughs> losing her mind. She's, she's um, a barkey. You, you know, I think, I think that uh, one of two things happens. You either need to figure out a way to get fill-in artists, which um, for us was a, a hard thing to figure out because the book is so much us. And then it, we came to the very obvious conclusion that we would just write the scripts for fill-in artists together. So Tyler's mm. voice is very much on them. So mm -hmm. like we have three fill-in, we're in the middle of three fill-in issues now with Josh Hickson, uh, Ricardo Lopez Ortiz and Sweeney Boo drawing them. And me and Tyler both wrote all three scripts. Um, nice. The other thing you can do is just have the book take breaks, which we're trying not to do, but we're in a slight break right now. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but the one nice thing about that too is weirdly uh, with having those built-in breaks and the way that things are structured, it's like, um, I mean, it's, it, it puts, I'm not by any means a fast artist. I'm not slow by any means either. I'm just sort of in that middle ground of 
you know, we can do a page a day, but I also color myself. So we're always going to need five weeks instead of four to do an issue. Um, and as much as we don't want to take breaks or these things, like I am trying to get, it's almost like um, training for me now, in a sense, it's a different type of comic making um, than what four kids was because four kids, well, four kids have a lot of different things, I guess different in the way that dead dogs was where I sort of did all of it. And then we released it. Um, uh, it's, it's an interesting thing. Um, you know, I, I have massive amounts of respect for people like uh, Ryan Stegman and, um, uh, or not Ryan Stegman. <laughs> no, not Ryan Stegman. Let's take that. No, Ryan Stegman. No, uh, Ryan Otley uh, hmm. and um, uh, Charlie Adler and, uh, you know, these guys who could just pump out month after month after month for years. Yeah. Um, create their own books. And it's just like you, those guys are a different breed of, of powerhouses of just being able to have that kind of ability and, and endurance. Um, that said, I agree with Matt that it's important to take a walk outside and stretch your bones. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm curious to kind of go towards what Matt was talking earlier about his editorial experience. Cause Tyler, you're, you, what you said is that you don't even, you don't even show it to an editor at all. There's, you know, you just, you, you, you give them pages and that's it. And they take them or they leave them and they take yeah. them. I so, I mean, um, so I guess I, I wonder, uh, in the context of you co-writing scripts for other people, mm -hmm. how has your experience co-writing those scripts changed your thought processes of how you create your own art or the things that you need to put into a script for, for another artist? Um, yeah, I mean, the I'm a lot more, I'm, I'm pretty similar to Matt because I feel like I, I never had any formal, I don't think Matt did either, but like I, I learned how to write comics by just making comics. Um, and so scripting is, um, you know, my script looks shockingly similar to Matt minus a, a font change uh, and uh, a couple of <laughs> doodads, but the, um, I'm, I'm pretty forgiving with, and, unless there's a thing where it's like, um, for instance, we, we got Sweeney's pages all in and they look amazing, but there was like an error in, the Sweeney's first language isn't um, English. And so there was simply just an error in who a character was supposed to be. And so that was my only edit of what it was supposed to be. And besides that, it's like, you know, there's choices I would have made differently, but that doesn't mean it's the right choice. Um, and so, and so it's that thing where it's like, I, I, it's not that Sweeney's choice was, was better or worse. It's just a different choice. And that'll be interesting sure. to see, you know, what, um, how that connects with readers and stuff. Uh, yeah, I just, I also, but I also, what I'm wondering is, is how does it, how does it connect to your own creativity at, at, at a certain oh, point? Oh, yeah, I mean, right? it's like, definitely, it's definitely where it's, um, <laughs> I see the benefit of being able to show things to people, I think, more in stages. I think it's, I think the reason why I never did it is uh, not wanting to waste people's times and also just like embarrassment at how hideous my thumbnails are. And now huh. it's the sort of thing where it's like, you know, there's me and Matt have a lot of different projects where there's projects that I'm just writing for uh, another artist right now and, 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 and different things like that. And, you know, it'll be interesting to see what that process will be like between me and that artist, because it'll obviously be very different than me and Matt, um, just like anybody's working relationship will be. Um, so I don't know. I'm still learning um, how that's all going to go. Sure. Uh, yeah. I think... Um, I mean, I, I would say that, you know, like Tyler saying, I'm still learning. Uh, Tyler understands making a comic as good as anyone I've ever met. Um, he definitely like just know, knows how to, how a page will work and I can send him things and he'll be like, that won't work. Like just instantly he gets like, well, that has to move and that has to shift. And he just understands it in an innate way. But when he says like, oh, I'm still learning, I, uh, you know, I, I don't want to be dismissive of that statement. I want to sort of dwell on that just because like, I feel like I'm still learning uh, in the same way about how to write for other people. Like I learn all the time, like how to do that. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm moving from Marvel to DC. I moved to a whole different stable of artists and I'm learning how to deal with them and how to, how to talk to them. And you're, you should always be learning. I think is, is the point. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's not, 
there's no there's no perfect way to write a script or communicate to an artist. It's just learning how to be in relationships, and every relationship is different. So you relearn that every time you start a relationship. Yeah. 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 There's also something you know powerful and wonderful about the collaboration of comics that that there is there is no one way to make comics. Particularly, yeah. there's no one way that's right to make comics. Uh, every way to make comics is pretty much as valid as, as the one next to it. I'm sure we could come up with some example of, no, that would never work. But for the <laughs> most part, you know, for the most part, whatever gets done is the right way to do it. I've interviewed people who do, you know, intricate thumbnails first. I've done interview people who just go straight to big. I just interviewed someone, uh, Nelly Furmark, who, who does the coloring of her pages first. She lays down what the color on the page is going to be, and then she starts drawing on top of the color. Oh, right? Great. I've never heard never. of that. That, that seems never. insane to me. And I said to her, D doesn't that mean you, you end up like throwing away pages all the time? She's like, oh, yeah, I throw away pages left and right. You know? <laughs> I, I, I'm like, that seems like a crazy way to work, but it works for them, you know? Yeah. I love it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's, uh, that is one I've never heard before. Right? Yeah. I mean, it makes sense, though, too, kind of. Like, I get it. You get a mood. You get sort of a feeling of, okay, yeah. like, this is purple. This is, yeah, like, no, I understand, I understand what she yeah. meant when she said it. It's just, like, that just seems like I – that's not the way that I understand how to it be done. But by the same token, Tyler, I mean, not showing anyone your thumbnails is not a thing that anyone has ever said to me before. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's <laughs> – I always thought I was seeing people time. And then Matt said to me one time, I was like, oh, I sound kind of rude, huh? Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the funny thing is like when we were doing, when we were putting the trade together, we knew that we weren't going to put a lot of back matter in it just because it's a monstrously huge book without that. But we yeah. were also like, I don't particularly love showing my scripts to people who aren't working on them. I feel like there's, a little too much glimpse behind the curtain and Tyler doesn't love showing roughs or character designs and like those things exist but we're both like we don't really have anything to put in there that we want like nothing there that adds to the enjoyment of the book that we, we feel right. like you know we're like a math that, teacher's worst, worst nightmare we refuse yeah, to show yeah. our work we don't want to our work we'll be like we'll get every problem right but you don't need to know why we got it yeah yeah, yeah. 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 No, I, I understand completely. Uh, it, speaking of the book, it, it is a big book. You are, that is, this is a lot of book. And it's, it was a lot of issues. I mean, this is just six issues, but some of these are 56, 58 pages, something like that. Yeah, the first two are, are both clock in around 60. We do a little cheap wow. because there's a bunch of black pages, but sure. not, not that many. No, um, it's like five of those to 55. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. That, that goes back to the thing we were talking about of, like, you know, what's different about an indie book. Like, uh, I can only squeeze in 20 or 22 pages into a script, and if it doesn't fit, it, you know, I have to make it fit. We don't do that. If, if there's a moment that needs more space, we take that space. And that means they're taking time. But at the end of the day, like, uh, I, know, I know this is not what you want to hear, Brian, as a retailer, but, like, if a book is shipping two weeks later but is better that's uh -huh. important to us you know like we want the no, it, to it's the it's important to me thing. too man okay. it's important to me too it's it's uh it's frustrating when you depend on a thing but uh but but if it if it makes a book a better book and therefore more people are reading it that's that's all to the good yeah. uh i learned i dude i learned that lesson from neil gaiman 33 years ago you know <laughs> <laughs> so you know that book was always late always late always late but it was consistently our best-selling book because it was such a good comic at the time yeah you know um it was there's, worth it you know yeah there's just moments where tyler will say like this is a splash page this isn't a panel and then it's like oh our book's a page longer and then i go it's funnier if they do this for a page and he goes it is funnier and then that book's a page longer <laughs> and so yeah. our, but our issues just to end up being I mean, it's funny because we we promoted it. it was like triple size first issue, like double size second issue, and then we were like normal size third issue. But like the sixth issue is like almost sixty pages again, and we weren't even right. promoting at that point. We were like, we just seem obnoxious if we're doing that. But like, yeah, it's it's uh, we make long comics. Sorry, I, was just I, I like, is I how 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 <laughs> difficult is this to do from a business point of view? Right. Like if you 
if, if you had planned that, that your costs were going to be, oh, this is a 32 page comic and all of a sudden it's 60 pages, you've got to come up with the extra money to print the book. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Um, even, yeah. even, even if merely they're, they're black pages, you're still printing those black pages. They oh. don't give you those black pages for free. No, they don't. Uh, no, yes. you know, no. it's, it's the joy of image is that they give us enough rope to hang ourselves. Like that's what everybody, you know, whether people will admit it or not, image, image is there to let you make your mistakes. And that's beautiful. And we love making our mistakes. And, you know, from a business point, that, that book is full of our mistakes. That book is chock full of bad business decisions of making extra long issues and, you know, like, uh, it's three, you know, I, I remember talking to uh, Nick Spencer and I said something and I said, yeah, you know, we're trying to figure out what to pr price our trade at. And he was like, you know, you want it cheap. You want your first trade cheap. And I was like, yeah, but it's 276 pages. And he, I heard him drop his phone and he was like, that's three trades. And I was like, no, it's, it's one. And he was like, you're idiots. Like cut it in half, cut it in half right now. You are, that doesn't help you. And I was like, we're in the volume business. Like, I don't know. That's, that's the business we're in, I guess. Yeah. Um, but you know, Nick's right to a degree. Like, if we, we could have split that in two trades, we make more money. But we're hoping that there's an audience that likes laying down twenty bucks for a really significant read for a lot of book. For we we slow burned the book on purpose. It it's a slow build, and so the trade has to be big to get you to the meat. Um, yeah. it's atmospheric. We wanted to make atmospheric comics that take space. Yeah. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I, uh, uh, but you know, it is worth pointing out that it makes it harder for you to make your money back on yeah. this as creative people who are working for themselves and are not working for a page, a, a pay, um, a page rate. Um, yeah. You know, hey, we're at, lucky at that neither of us are. Oh, it's just, we're, we're lucky that neither one of us are sailors. Yeah. This book ain't buying anybody a boat or yeah, yeah. Right. Going on it's... a lavish vacation. Right. Right. Uh, but it's it's. That's the thing that's, I mean, like, um, the, that's, I mean, the other thing that's a joy from image and different things is, you know, as long, it, it, it's almost like an experiment, right? Like if, if we can do this and we can still afford to keep doing the book, then that means that there's an audience for the book, right? Like it's almost like a science experiment. It's sort of like, uh, this can, this, we can go as long as, you know, me and Matt are, are, are feeding ourselves feeding ourselves and doing good work yeah. um you know that's uh it's 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 a lot of, i know i like it's hard for a lot of creative people i think to to know whether or not what they're doing is good and if it can keep coming out each month i guess that means it's yeah. not the worst thing coming out each month well yeah. all, you know also because of the just the production schedule and the way that the solicitation cycle works and you know you pretty much have to get six issues kind of done before you even find out if you've made enough money yeah. Yeah. to do it. You know, um, we had a very funny thing when we started the book because we had an ending. We basically had three endings and we were like, one will be issue seven. If nobody buys this one will be issue 15. If a few people buy it and one will be issue 30. If a lot of people buy it. Mm -hmm. And so when image was like soliciting it, they kept saying like, you know, is this an ongoing, is it a mini? What do you want it to be? And we were like, we don't want to say because we don't know. And we don't want to say ongoing and then, you know, eat crow on it. And we don't want to say it's a mini and then have people, you know, we just don't want to commit. And at a certain point, Jeff Boyson, who was the head of sales at image uh, at the time called us and he was like, just say it's an ongoing, your numbers are going to be fine. Like you guys are skittish and the numbers came in great and have stayed very good. We, we, we are found that audience and stuff, but yeah, we were very much treading on eggshells, not, not sure how to do the book, how to approach it. Um, it's a good learning curve for us though, because like, we knew we were making something that was weird and we knew we were making something that wasn't necessarily for everybody. And our belief was, by making something that's a little weirder and a little different, it'll find its audience. It'll make its way to its audience and they'll be passionate enough about it to keep us afloat. And that was our gamble. And uh, it seems to have paid off. There's a really passionate audience for the book and who, have, who are buying it every month. And that's nice. Yeah. 
Yeah. I it Tyler, is it scarier for you as an artist working in that financial method only because art is is your sole way of of making right? Oh, yeah. So if, oh, yeah. if 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 Rosenberg, you know, like if it doesn't make money, he's got seven Marvel scripts he could write theoretically. Yeah. Theoretically, you know? Yeah. But he's fucked because I know where he lives. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But no, no, for real, it is it is terrifying. It was the thing where I left a <laughs> I left a very well paying job with a four hundred one k and healthcare uh, to do this book. Um, that I, you know, I was very lucky. And during the pandemic, I got a job uh, being the lead designer at a publisher, um, uh, and. You know, it sort of got to be a rock and hard place where it was either I can keep this job that feels very comfortable um, and, you know, occasionally put out comics um, as I chip away at them on nights and weekends, or I can go and do this thing with Matt um, that we were planning to do, um, you know, before the world shut down for going on however many years now. And yeah, uh, yeah no, I mean, it's just, it was a risk and it was scary. And I think it seems to really have paid off. Um, and the cool thing about that is, uh, you know, it's if I didn't take that risk, I wouldn't. I'm lucky I took that risk and paid off because uh, now there's other things that I'm going to get to do because of that, that I, I've always really wanted to do. So um, that's ter terrifying. And I don't know that it's a good idea. I don't know if I, I, if somebody was in my position, I don't know if I would to tell them to do what I did. Um, mm. But lucky it paid off. Yeah, I mean, I remember at the time, like Tyler was like, yeah, you know, I put in notice in my job and, you know, he, he was working with people who I was friends with and uh, he was like, you know, I put in notice in my job and then he would call me like an hour later and be like, tell me that I didn't screw up. Like, tell me that I didn't mess this up. And I was like, no, no, you're fine. We're going to do well. We're going to do well. Like, and he's like, yeah, yeah, no, I know we are. And like, I, and I, I, you know, he would, I would be this voice of confidence for him. He'd be rattled and he'd be like, just tell me that I didn't just like mess up my, my future. And I'd be like, no, you're fine. And I'd hang up the phone and I would just say the same thing be like, God, I hope we didn't just fuck up. Like, I really hope that I didn't just take my best friend and tell him, to quit his job to do a really stupid thing with me but i had to be confident on the phone and be like no dude you're fine you're gonna do great we're gonna sell so many books and then i'd just be like oh my god this is so scary it, are, the, are the numbers where you were hoping they would be higher than they you thought a little less where, where you at roughly i think they're higher than i thought i mean yeah. you know what's funny is that we asked image for uh a, a prediction when we were trying to decide how to approach the book and they were like we don't really do that <laughs> we were like can we get any sort of guesswork and they were like we don't really do that that's not something we do because it's very volatile and everything's different and i was like can you just get me a, a pnl like a profit and loss chart on like a window that we could be in and they were like yeah we can do that and so they sent us like what we would make at all these different things for the first issue and um we doubled the high end of their PL chart on the first nice. issue. And nice. so I was like, oh, okay. That then like, you know, that sort of kept us going. And the, you know, we were, we, uh, the single issues we knew would, we're not, we're not a book. We're not a big speculator book. And we knew we wouldn't be, we didn't set out to be, um, I, I don't think many people do set out to be that, but there are certainly those books, you know, your stray dogs and department of truths and things that have, rabid fan bases that read the book and love it but also have this other rabid fan base that are you know collectors and and we sort of knew that we weren't going to be that book and we didn't make a lot of effort to be that book particularly um and so we're we're at a place where we're really happy with how many people are buying the book because they seem to be reading it and not yeah. just i mean obviously there are people who are cgcing it and slabbing it and that's fine if that's what they want to sure. do um but that doesn't seem to be what our core audience is yeah. And that's really uh, nice because that feels a little more stable to me than the speculation market is more volatile in my mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, the tr and the trade did well, so we're happy with that. It's an expensive yeah. trade, so it's nice. Yeah. Um, uh, was the book returnable, as, as I recall? No, no, it wasn't. No, we had a week. Oh, you were right. Yeah, it was right when they weren't doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, were yeah, like, yeah. we were like, we're going to be returnable. And they were like, Diamond says we can't be returnable. Right, right. Yeah. Um, 
and you know, a testament uh, stores stores really backed it without it being returnable, and we're always appreciative of that. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like I said, me and Tyler both worked in a comic shop that didn't have didn't sell back issues, so I think both of us have that level of PTSD yeah. when you see a book that's a month old on the rack and it's this thick. For mm -hmm. us at the store we used to work at, that's just lost money. That's gone. Those are, mm -hmm. that's burnt money. And so we're very cognizant of any store taking a risk on the book. And we're always trying to figure out, like, if you have a stack of these, let us know. Like, let us know how we can help you not. That's, mm -hmm. that's something that we always try for. And stores um, have been very great for the most part and supportive. And it means the world to us. Yeah, no, I, 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 would, I would put you guys in kind of the top 10 of, people who work hard for their book that work hard to support physical stores that work hard to make pe sure that people are aware that they should be buying it in a store and they should go through the normal store process. I, I and retailers almost certainly never thank you enough for that. So let me on behalf of all of my peers go, no, really it makes a huge, huge difference that you do that and that you take that seriously uh, and it means a lot to all of us. Well, thank you. Know? you. Thank you. I, I will say that, you know, there are a lot of stores and, I, I, you know, uh, me and Tyler are the same. We we travel the country and we just go into every comic shop we see and sort of try and... We're nerds for them. Yeah. We're like, just, even more than comics, like going to see... Go oh, to see stores. Set it up? And so, this retailer doing? yeah, I, I always say, like, I'm never going to pressure a store to take more copies of a book than they think they can sell. Like, that's a disgusting thing to do, to be like, can you take some more? Like, no, take what you take what you can to get sell out of. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't, and I understand that there's stores all over the country that, that aren't hand sell stores that, that can't back our book, that don't have an audience for it. And, and we appreciate those stores for bringing in a copy, but there are stores like your shop, which, you know, I, you know, I have a huge soft spot for and, mm -hmm. um, you know, third eye and, and mm -hmm. forbidden planet and, and stores across, across the country that are, and across the world that are just champions of, of creators and books they believe in and like. You know, I I always say it's it's when I go to my local shops and they're always like, oh, you know, the staff gets excited and are like, I, I always have to be like, I'm just like you, like I'm four months away from working here again, and you're four months away from having my job. We all have the same job. Like, it's all this comic, like, like and, and I believe that, like, I I really do. I, it's like I don't see the separation between retail and creative and publishing. Like, obviously, sure. they're different parts, but it's just one machine, and like, I work for all three parts of that machine. Yeah, and and it's you know it's particularly. I mean, I think it's one of the strengths of of this business that we came up. The reason that there are comic book stores is because they were fans. Do you know what I mean? Like it wasn't, it, it isn't, I don't, I don't think that there's a lot of people out there who are like, like I'm a big fan of, of books, like in the same way as yeah. they are of comics, you know, sure. that, that we would, that you have a culture around it that really only exists here. And, um, you know, it, it, in my, in my darkest moments of thought, you know, it's always about our, our largest gatekeepers you know, Marvel and DC, or I really should say Disney and Warners, uh, or Discovery now, I guess, uh, you know, that unfortunately, I think that there's a lot of people at those companies, not necessarily at DC itself or at Marvel itself, but the people above them who just don't, who don't yeah. value what we do at all. Sure. And they don't understand how special comics truly are as a medium in that we have this vast web of independently owned yeah. and operated stores who are all just trying to sell the best comics they can. Yeah. That's what we care about. We don't, I mean, making money is great. I, I want to make money too. But the reason I sell comics is because I want to sell good comics, you yeah. know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and I, and that's, that's important. That's important. And I, anyway, I, I, Sorry, I think I'm it's right. funny for, for me, like I, I, before I was making comics, I worked in the music business and I used to try and sell records to record stores. And it's such a funny, like broken system compared to comics in so many ways. 
And, but I think the thing that always struck me is like, I would do retail calls for record stores and I would call a record store and be like, hi, I have this new record coming out for this band. And I talked to them for 10 minutes and then they'd be like, this is a soul music store. And I'd be like, oh, okay, yeah, sorry. Like this is punk rock and hang up. And, and you'd have this like fractionalization that comic shops don't have. And like, you know, we'd, you'd also have distributor stuff, which was also a whole other headache. But like from the indiest indie, you know, desert island in Brooklyn or, you know, whatever, the beguiling, whatever the indiest indie shop in the world to the most like YA aimed comic shop, there is there is overlap in every yeah. comic shop. There's a connectivity. And, yeah. and that's really a beautiful thing that it's like, yeah, we are literally all doing the same thing. And like, I, maybe, I, I maybe. fundamentally think it's because of the periodical comic mm -hmm. and it's because of the catalog driven nature of soliciting that periodical comic that every month we get a common translator book yeah right we we all every comic book store in the world reads previews yeah right we all take different things from it we all react differently to it but we have that same through line that's not true of bookstores right bookstores don't order by the month bookstores or order by like the season yeah. Which doesn't even fucking make any sense, like when you think about it, um, uh, you know. And and the same thing with record stores, right? Like you you order based upon the catalog that you get from an individual record yeah. seller, not of a here's your overview of what your industry looks like. Yeah. And yeah. and that's a powerful thing in comics. And again, I I constantly worry that the powers that be are trying to get rid of periodical comics. You know, yeah, because yeah. they just don't understand it or what the power or the magic of it without understanding that it's actually the thing that makes comics work at all as an art form. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I liked your column this week, by the way. Brian. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, yeah. No, I, I, I wasn't you know, pushing for a compliment there. I, <laughs> no, I, I know. It was a good, it was an organic segue for yeah, me to say. Yeah. But uh, no, I, you know, I agree. I think there, there's, Yes, there's always a fear that that the periodical that there are people who don't get it, and I think there's people everywhere who don't get it. But I think that there's, you know, I find a lot of a lot of joy in in going to a comic shop and seeing a ten year old and a seventy year old shopping side by side, and that's not something you see in a lot of places. And like buying the same thing, rather, and like that's. That's something magical, and I think that's something that periodical comics. I mean, comic shops are, uh, you know, they're a gateway drug. Like discovering a comic shop that's good is is a whole new world for you. And and like I I, I talk about it all the time that like you know I used to tour with bands. And the thing we did, I would always say is like, let's find out where the local comic shop is because it's probably in the cool neighborhood with the good coffee shop, the good restaurant, the good bookstore, the good records. Like they're all going to be around there, but you can have a coffee shop or in a, in a boring part of town, you can have a cool restaurant, but a comic shop is always going to be a sort of cultural mecca in a way that other things aren't. And that's one of the reasons that I've been to so many comic shops is that I just travel the country in a van being like, what is the comic shops in this town and going there. And I do think like it, it, there's just something when you find that comic shop that clicks for you, that will just change your life forever. And I, I, I very much am afraid of what this industry looks like without that as a graphic novel business. It's just a completely different thing. And it's so the most passionate people I know are comics fans and I don't know people that passionate about books. They're, they exist, but like comics fans by nature, comics create that passion. They find those passionate people and comic shops are their connection to that. And I, I think that that's so magical and so unique that, yeah, I mean, it's something that I, I just decided early on, like, yeah, hey, I wanna fight for this forever. Like, this is something so important to me and what I do and what I wanna do for the rest of my life. Like, Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's 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 hard to imagine a book like this existing were it not for comic stores, right? Like, yeah. it, it's hard to picture this work as a graphic novel. No, it can't. It can't. We couldn't have done it that way yeah. at all. Yeah. Uh, um, and it, it, you know, we wouldn't have tried. It's not even the thing where y you would try and fail. It, you, the, the, the thought would never have existed if that was the market we lived in. Yeah. There's no There's no point in thinking about 
that kind of doing a book like what's the first place from here if you don't have an audience in single issues if you don't have people who are willing to like be hooked every month we can't just be like come back in 10 months and find out what this thing means like it doesn't work it's not rewarding yeah. And it's yeah. a little, this is a little less, um, the book itself even, it reads like a single, it reads more like a digest, say, than it reads like a graphic novel. Oh, yeah. like mm -hmm. too. When you're going through it, it's like, yeah, the reading experience, it almost feels like you took the six issues and just put them in a bucket together. Right? Yeah. 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 By design, and, by design, as opposed yeah. to, you know, yeah. some yeah. other books that come out month to month, even at Image or things like that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the thing, the thing that I love, and, you know, I think Brubaker uh, was nice enough to give us that quote about it, but I think, you know, the thing that, that really touched me a lot early on was people being like, this feels like, you know, the early 90s indie boom. This feels like black and white comics to me. This feels like black and white indies. And, like, that's an era that I love and, and Tyler loves and, like, to be to be trying to carry the torch of that, which we definitely are. We definitely want to be doing something that doesn't feel like, you know, and it's not a shot at the books that are coming out now. We love the books that are coming out now. Sure. But I don't, I didn't, we didn't want to make the book where you buy issue one and you can turn to the last page and be like, okay, that's the premise. That's the movie poster. Now I know what the book is. Right. We wanted to make something that's about a journey, not. Right. Here's here's a premise. Do you like it? And right. and that and that can only exist in single issues. Yeah, and 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 broadly, I would say that books that are here's the premise books. Here's here's my movie pitch. You know, yeah. uh, almost always are comics that aren't good. Sure. I mean, sometimes you get good ones, sometimes you do, but for the most part, they're they don't have they don't have that magic, that sticky magic between. Between the audience and 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 the creator, the yeah. stores and the creator, the, the the whole ecosystem is is an important part of of indie comics. You know, uh, yeah. I think. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. You know, and when I and when I again when I think of how other kinds of businesses, if you start telling them about how comics work. They actually start getting excited by the notion of like, wait, you have people come in every single week. Yeah on a certain day to look for the new stuff like they would die for that uh, right like I, that's that's not a thing that happens in most places i don't know not not with the same culture you know yeah yeah, yeah. maybe uh, the grocery I mean, store i mean i remember talking I, I being at one of the marvel I, I mean, a grocery store yeah but that's you know that's because if you I don't have the culture you die, right yeah, yeah that's not culture yeah I, um just joking i i uh I remember being at one of the Marvel summits and we were talking about retail and, and David Gabriel was talking about something and someone made some point And I remember Dan Buckley who's the, the head of Marvel uh, stood up and he very passionately gave us this speech to the creators in the room. You know, it's the Marvel exclusive writers. So it's, you know, it's Jason Aaron and John Hickman and, and Tom easy Coates and me and Zdarsky and all these people lined up. It's Mark Wade. And, and Dan Buckley was like, what we have with comic shops is so special and so important. And he gave this really passionate speech about how what we, the relationship that publishers and creators have with comic shops, it, it, we can never take it for granted because any other industry would kill to have what we have. He was like, we make a product and they take it in and they know there's an audience who will be there every week. And he was like, no one else has that. No one else comes close to that. And he was like, when people tell you that, you know, comics are in trouble or comics are in bad shape, he's like, those are people with an agenda because any other industry looks at our industry and is jealous and is desperate to figure out how to make a fan base that excited and that loyal and that passionate about what they make as what we have. And I, that always stuck with me as like a really, really important thing to just be like, yeah, even, you know, like even on our worst day, we have these people who are so passionate, you know, like that's, that's what I remind myself when, when things are bad and you're getting yelled at by someone about something or, you know, you have some terrible fan interaction where they ask you what your page rate is and, you know, I, I tell you you're overpaid or whatever. I, I'm like, they're here because they're so passionate about yeah. this job. And that's, yeah. you know, that's the other side of the coin. But like, 
we have this job because of that passion. So we take the good with the bad and that's fine. Like I'll take it any day of the week. Yeah. That's, that's really heartening to hear that, that Buckley gave that speech actually. Uh, Cause I, I, you know, from again, from my side of the table, there are times that I am very cynical about that company and their motivations, you know? Um, so it's, 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 it's it's a building full of people who love comics. I can tell. No, you I, I, obviously it is, right? Yeah. Oh, obviously it is. I just, uh, you know, um, I think, and I think that you guys can relate to this as speaking as guys who worked at a comic shop that didn't really do back issues, right? Mm -hmm. Like it, the collectible thing sure. that Marvel and DC do is is probably not conducive to actually helping the things that that we're talking about here broadly i think that it's more complicated than that again i, I it goes back to my and I, obviously i know that you think that as well but i think it goes back to the idea that i was talking about before that it's an ecosystem that mm -hmm. i think that that you know um people who are cgcing our book help us make a book for people who don't know what cgc is um, shops that are trying to just get incentive covers and are throwing the other books in the dumpster help us, you know, make our book, help Image make their book. And I understand that there is, you know, a difference in the audience and a difference in the readership. And there is, you know, and, and Marvel's doing 100 covers on a book. And, like, is that getting 100 new readers into the book? No, obviously not. It's a different business model. But it does allow Marvel or DC or whoever to appeal to a different kind of collector who keeps a lot of shop, helps keep a lot of shops lights on, who help, you know, keep a lot of people employed. So I, I think that while a book like ours doesn't chase that audience, you know, like we're, we're more thinking that we're going to go after a love and rockets audience than a, than a Batman audience for the most part. And maybe we're wrong about that, but that's, you know, what we envision. Um, the fact of the matter is that we're kind of going to end up in everybody with little pieces of everybody's audience and everybody is um, you're going to get, you know, the Hernandez brothers are benefited by Marvel's variant program sure. as much as, as much as the Marvel is benefited by the Hernandez brothers doing love and rockets in some. Yeah. Ways. yeah and, and, no, I, I, I agree with you broadly uh, about the ecosystem. I just know that ecosystems need to be um, tended to carefully. Sure. Otherwise, it's very easy to let one or more plants run wild and and wreck the ecosystem for everybody else. You know, um, when, you know, I agree with you. Yes, stores that are chasing incentive covers help in some fashion, but, you know, not when those stores tend to go out of business a couple of years later because they're buying the wrong comics. And, you know, I, I, I know I know a lot of stores that went out of business, like when Turok 1 and Adventures of Superman 500 came out you know, uh, and both flopped at the same time. And a lot of stores who had went like, no, we're, we're these, this lottery thing's always going to work. And then it stopped working one day, of course. you know? Um, yeah. That, no, that's I, my concern. That That's where my concern is. You yeah, know, I, I, I think I, I've watched, I've, I've watched, I've watched stores go out of business three times now. Like there's been three major crashes in my lifetime. Sure. And I don't think we can survive, survive a fourth one. Sure. I would like to think that every time, obviously there's good stores who go out of business. My childhood store went out of business yeah. in the, in the late nineties and that was a heartbreaker for me. And, um, but I think that there is, uh, what you're seeing now more than ever is stores that are, are sharp and savvy and bringing things into the 21st century in a good way. And like, like the graphic novel club, like, uh, I'll be honest, I'm shocked that more stores don't do it. Um, it, you know. it it is it is crazy to me that I'm just like yeah every creator in the world would would line up to have this opportunity that me and Tyler have right now and um, but I, but I think that I see a lot of things the stores do that are savvy and I think you're getting a lot of savvy stores and you're getting a more diverse market in some ways not more diverse than it's ever been but you know since I've been making comics I've been hearing oh you know Marvel and DC doing these variant covers and all these things and in that time you know we've had. Uh, Black Mask and and Vault and TKO sure. and and all these Aftershock and AWA and all these new publishers coming up and and I'm like there's more opportunities to be a publisher to be a published creator there's more stories there's more diversity in those stories there's more yeah. diversity in the people making them and so I I I hesitate to 
to say that the the biggest trees are 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 casting too much shade when the garden seems really richer to me than it's been in my career. I, I agree with that 100%. I just think that those two biggest trees uh, could could be a lot healthier than they are right now. And I, I fundamentally am nervous that there's basically not a book that's selling regularly over 100,000 copies anymore sure. at, at either of those companies. And, and I think that it's mismanagement from, from, from the brand, you know, I I um, you know, I, know I think it's, I think it's having 27 Batman books a month rather than having five really good ones. Um, ultimately. I, I, I disagree with that. I mean, I think that's okay. like saying, uh, as someone who writes the 25th Batman book, I would disagree with it. Um, the, uh, the, the, I, you know, I think that there's a, there's a thing you know, if you look at television, like nobody gets mash ratings anymore. You know, no one's right. hitting the mash finale numbers, but that doesn't mean that uh, no one's going to have a TV in a few years. It means that Breaking Bad's finale does one fiftieth of what Mash does, and uh, you know, F Boy Island does one twentieth of what Mash did. And like, is that better? No. Like, yeah, would it be cool if Batman sold two hundred thousand copies and and also? You know, our book sold 100,000 copies. Yeah, that would be cool. But it means that if it means that there's more choices and more diversity and on the shelves, maybe that's the sure. better option. Um, I, I would anecdotally you know, too. It's it's a sort of thing. I think I, I I don't have any of the numbers to sort of back this up, but I see. You know, for instance, growing up in uh, Buffalo, uh, I didn't have a shop in the suburb I grew up in. And that's why I got all my comics from flea markets, garden sales. And it was books that had come out 10 years before I was born. Now I, I, li I live in New York for a long time. I live in Buffalo again. Now uh, there is five new shops in five different suburbs that all surround as well as in the city of Buffalo that all cater to totally different audiences. And mm -hmm, so it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting to see where it's like, we have, um, you know, uh, uh, Gutter Pop, which is sort of doing the Desert Island thing, and Queen City Bookstore is sort of does the superhero thing. But then you also have um, uh, 716 Pulp that sort of caters more towards the like boom and YA market. And it's it's interesting to see how it's like, even in just like the small ecosystem that I live in, how the audience has changed, where it's, it's like, you know, sure. 10, uh, 15 years ago, those stores couldn't exist. And now those stores here are like thriving just because the shift in like so many new YA readers, the the ability for a little bit more of a sophisticated audi uh, comic reading audience to exist so that in a city of 300,000 people, a shop like Gutter Pop can exist because there's enough people who want to read, you know, uh, the, whatever the new drawn quarterly or fan graphics book is, which yeah. is 10, 15 years ago. I don't think that audience existed for that shop to stay open. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder how much that's happening across the country. The thing Matt was saying earlier about like, the comic shop is always in the cool district. I wonder how much the shifting of readers and the type of product and things that comes out where it's like, hopefully this is probably me being um, uh, pie in the sky, rosy eyed Marvel and DC aren't as necessary um, to the survival of the industry as they once were, but I could also be totally wrong because I don't know the numbers um, as hard. Yeah. I mean, in, in, in terms of raw numbers, there, there's still a really significant percentage of the total sales. And, and so yes, they're necessary, but I take your point. Absolutely. That there are stores thriving without them um, uh, as their primary focus. I mean, certainly Marvel and superhero comics have not been our primary focus for a very, very long time, you know, and we're able to do a graphic novel of the month club where, you know, if we do one Marvel or DC book a year, uh, that's a lot for us, you know? Yeah. Um, and I usually have to explain it to my, you know, to my subscribers, like, okay, this is going to be the good one. You're going to, you're going to like this one, <laughs> you know? Um, uh, so yeah. So for, I mean, from that point of view, it's certainly healthy. I, I don't mean to be cynical. I just, uh, you know, um, I've just been doing this a really long time, yeah. and you know, and and my column's called "Tilting in Windmills, Not Smiling in the Sunshine." So, how, <laughs> can I can I ask you a question, Brian? Yeah, how please. Long, how long have you felt like, oh, things are are you know, if I go back and read your column from fifteen years ago, am I going to be seeing some of the same sentiment? You're going to be seeing some of the same sentiment uh, in terms of uh, 
people not taking advantage of things in the way that I think that they should be. Um, uh, for example, I mean, I, I've held the opinion for 20 years that Diamond should have done a whole lot more to find the next bone um, instead of getting all the way into bed with Marvel and DC and letting Marvel and DC basically dictate the way that they run, ran their business. Ultimately, it, it didn't work out for Diamond because they've just lost Marvel and DC. They're probably never going to get them back in the way that they ever, you know, that they had them. Uh, and I don't know that I believe the diamonds going to be long for this world as a result of those decisions, because they didn't take the steps to, to find and advocate for creative voices um, rather than uh, brands. But again, dealing with brands and dealing with big companies is a whole goddamn lot easier than trying to deal with like 500 different people who are each doing their own comic and half of them aren't anywhere near good enough to, to, you know, you know, I mean, I get it. I just uh, things things we it could it could have been brighter. That's all. If everybody had just uh, thought a little more more down the the road, in my opinion, okay. such as it is. <laughs> I, I I like I like this interview though, where you're asking me questions. Yeah, yeah. Please, yeah. please 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 go on. <laughs> Hey, speaking of questions, by the way, people, um, uh, just audience out there, if you have any questions for uh, Tyler and Matt, ask them in the sidebar. Almost no one's asking questions, so I guess I'm doing a good job with the interview. Um, so, But if you do have something, throw it in the thing, and we'll try to get it asked on your behalf, because we like doing that as well. For sure. Uh, let's talk about the physical making of the book. Um, you're writing a full script, Matt? Yeah? Yes, yes. Uh, are you guys writing the script at all together or are you just sort of you're bouncing the ideas then you write the script yeah we bounce the okay. ideas we get together we sort of beat out what the issues are to to probably you know a couple paragraphs per issue where it's just like these things have to happen um we need to hit these benchmarks and then i go back and i write a very detailed script you know like 20 page script 25 page script and send it to Tyler, and then uh, I hold my breath for five months, and I don't know what he's doing, and then... Uh, five months? It takes a long time. Five months? <laughs> wait, wait, let me back up. 22 to 25? How long are you expecting? The one I don't right here is... Yeah, I, the one I'm working on right now is 35 pages. Oops. Okay, so they're long. Uh, they're long. Um, <laughs> I was told once that uh, by an artist that you should never let your script, your your page, go past a page. Like your script page for a comic page should only be a page because the artist needs to print it out and hold it up. And I was like, well, sometimes it just does. And uh, they were like, it never should. And I was like, well, I don't know what to do there. Like they have to tape two pieces of paper together. They have to tape two pieces of paper together. I'm sorry. And I remember saying that to Donny Cates once, and he was like, yeah, no, I believe in that. And I was like, you never write a page that goes longer than a single page? He goes, no, I just shrink the, the font. And I, like, oh. and I was like, that's not. And he's like, and I was like, okay, Donnie, that's not. I don't think that's what they're talking about. Um, but I loved it. It is a, it is a perfect Donnieism. The, uh, yeah, so I write that and then I give it to Tyler and then he takes uh, five, for a great amount of time. Uh, five weeks. Five weeks. And then I get something back that looks like a book. And we yeah. have Hassan, who is our brilliant letterer, and then he very quickly letters it for us. And we go, thank you, Hassan, you're the best. And, and so, Tyler, when you get that script, like, what, what's, what's the next thing that you do? Do you just start doing the, the, the thumbnails for yourself? Uh, so I, I, I'll read the script uh, probably twice. Um, then I'll send Matt an email that says, uh, thanks, uh, and then I'll start thumbnailing. Um, Sometimes and... it says, good job. <laughs> Sometimes. That's true. Sometimes. Uh, but I generally, it's funny, I used to work, when I was doing um, Four Kids and, and Dead Dogs and other ones, I used to bounce around in an issue um, and sort of like thumbnail a page that I had a really clear idea for and then I'd go to maybe ones that I didn't, whatever. And now, for whatever reason, I don't know if it's just the nature of doing an ongoing series and with how long it's been, it's, I sort of go very much in order now. So it's just page by page, thumbnail, um, and uh, yeah, thumbnail, pencil, ink, uh, flat color, 
um, page by page. Uh, so it's like I'll thumbnail for every page, then I'll pencil for every page, then I'll. Uh, generally, I try and pencil and ink a page in the same day. So mm -hmm. I guess that's the crossover, but then that goes off to the flatter and then I color it. Yeah. Interesting. Um, uh, what, what kind of thumbnails do you do? Are they, how, how big are they? Or is it, uh, sort of like four to a, to a uh, page? Uh, <laughs> this is why we don't show them. Uh, let's see if I have any laying around. Um, uh, this isn't from the current thing that we're working. This was from a different thing I did, but, um, it's like, it's like that. They're just okay. figures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. It's just sort of like, and then if I need more information, I just sharpie on a piece of the legal pad mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. just lay out where mm -hmm. things need to be. That was great. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, but, no, I like using the legal pads because they're pretty cheap, and I like doing it with a sharpie um, and just kind of getting blocks of where it's because at that stage it's just graphic design. It's just where do elements need to be compositionally so that lettering can fit, so that it can all flow for the reading. Is there anything weird we're doing with paneling? It, like at that point, it's just that. And then once that's all done, I open up Photoshop and I, I pencil entirely digitally. And that's because of uh, speed. It's just way faster to be able to, um, I sort of, I don't even scan in my thumbs. I sort of just leave it next to me on the side of my mm -hmm. desk and I kind of just block everything in from there. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and then the laboring of, Penciling, although penciling's gotten, I'm getting faster at that. Finally, at age 32, it's not as. I think I'm finally starting to learn how to do it. Aren't you 31? 31, yeah. <laughs> uh, and and how about the the inking? Are you inking digitally as well, or are you outputting no. it to paper? I, uh, and then... Yeah, I output it to paper and then ink traditionally. That part's just the the most fun part of it. Mm -hmm. um, getting to like still play with all the ink tool. Like I wish I was um, one of those people who could just pencil pages. Um, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Tom Riley's work, but he's staying with me tonight and he's one of those old school guys who just everything's on a piece of paper and he's just got it. He's just got that speed and like can he flies at it. But when I'm doing it, um, generally I'm such a heavy hander. I'll destroy a piece of paper trying to figure out the pencils and have to then light box onto another piece of paper and then light box on it before we even get to the inking stage. So doing it on the computer is just saves everybody uh, a lot of time and the, the planet, a lot of paper. Yeah. How, how much of the, um, I don't know, the craft and the language for you is, is between the penciling and the ink. If you see what I mean, like in terms of, I, I don't know, like an expression on a face, you know, I'm just, I literally flipped to a random page. So here we have a random page and there's some, you know, ex expression on the face. Uh, uh, how much of that, it, how much of the, of the thinking process of, of what you're doing is in the pencil stage versus the ink stage? If, if that, if that's yeah, even a rational most, question. Yeah, yeah, no. Most of the thought there is is in the penciling stage. Okay. I, my pencils are real are really tight. Um because mm -hmm. I, I I I that's where all the acting is because it's like, mm -hmm. you know, the, the thumbnails is the, the graphic design, right? Let's get the elements where they need to be. And then the penciling, I like to think about that as the, the acting or the shooting stage mm -hmm. to use like film terms for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Um and then by the time we get to inking, it's sort of um not that it's set dressing, but it's, it's sort of, it's, it's giving it that final, um, I don't know. It's that it's, 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 I, it's, it's sort of putting a color, you know, it's, it's, it's just that and coloring that inking in the coloring at this point, I think as, uh, I have started to leave more and more things to simply coloring. Mm -hmm. Um, it used to be a thing when I was younger, you know, I would think that I'd have to, ink parts of the background so that like as though somebody else was going to come and color the page without me having ever talked to them and they mm -hmm. would need to interpret what i meant through this inking thing and sure. i don't know why it's taking me this as long as it has to be like oh like i'll just you know there's a scene where um we do a montage of three panels and three panels of um the gang sort of walking during a day and one of the panels is like i think it's uh, it almost looks like the kids walking through a nuclear 
cloud of some nonsense. And it's when I, back in the day, if I would have been inking that, I would have tried to ink every cloud and, and, and every little bit of rubble. And now it's just like, well, no, we ink the, the silhouettes of these figures. So we get the impression. And then, you know, when we come to coloring, it's almost more painterly. It's like, no, we're going to paint in these yeah. clouds and, and do this sort of thing. So yeah, yeah, yeah. it's, it's interesting to advent. I'm still playing with that, that idea of, um, you know, I, my favorite cartoonists are Dan Klaus and the Hernandez brothers and Adrian uh, Tomeine. And um, they're very much of that old school, you know, we use a black incline because that's how the printer process works. We use flat color because that's how the printing process works. Mm -hmm. And I love that stuff. But the, some of the tools that we have now with, you know, digital coloring and, and printing being so good, it's just, it's hard to not also look at, you know, a lot of um, maybe like water, like you go and look at Mobius's watercolored pages where he would do that sort of stuff. Or um, Matt finally turned me on to, um, um uh jippy um yeah this guy uh really good yeah so uh and looking at jippy's watercolors with his his sort of um his his sort of loose light mm -hmm. ink line and, and 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 it's hard now to not it's so easy for me to experiment with the mm -hmm. with the computer um mm -hmm. and try that on a page without having to worry about the like Oh, well, I just wasted a day's worth of labor. So that I, okay, now I don't have two hundred bucks anymore because you got to think about that in your sure. You know, it's your it's your job. So what's your hourly sure. wage? And I can now try it because it's on a computer space and not on a piece of paper that's going to ruin an underdrawing or something like that. And if it doesn't work, okay, that was five minutes. Who cares? Yeah. Um, but then there's the other thing too, where it's you're trying to, I don't know, it's it's merging the traditional sort of where comics comes from with sort of our new digital tools. And you never want the comic to look like it's a still from an animated movie, if that makes sure. sense. Sure. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I'm rambling about a bunch of the stupid things that are running through my head when I'm doing a panel. No, no, that, that, no, that's great. I, I, I love hearing this kind of stuff. When you, um, when you're doing these kinds of experiments, uh, are you effectively then doing them in the penciling stage? Then I'm doing, they're kind of happening. Um, yeah, yeah, that'll happen. We're all finished pencils for a thing. I'll change the line work to look totally black, and then I'll block in some color and see what it looks like. See what it and looks if like. It works, yeah, yeah. Then I yeah. can be like, okay. And then you ink. That. Then you ink with that in knowledge that that yeah. oh, it worked. Makes yeah. makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it makes a lot of yeah. sense. Yeah. yeah, yeah. When and so and so when you're producing, you're you're a little less than a, a page a day, though. It sounds like if it's taken to you. Five. Well, yeah, but is it taking you, is it taking you five weeks because you guys are doing sixty page issues, or is it taking you five weeks because you can't do a page a day? I, I can generally do a page a day of pencils and inks, yeah. um, but the, that last so for instance, like four and five were a little bit closer to 22, 24 pages, uh, yeah. and I did those in a month. It's just I need or I did it in five weeks. Just I need the extra week to do the cover for the solicits that that's going to be due at the end of that week as well as color every single page so i'll take right. four days to color an issue sure um, sure sure uh and then yeah so it's about a, it's about a page a day maybe we squeeze a saturday and a sunday in there um yeah. if we need to get some pages yeah. inked and then yeah that last week is for coloring and i also do the design work for all the books so i also have to design the packaging for everything and make sure that's all done and that takes a day yeah yeah, no, it, that makes sense. Um, I'm told we have a uh, we have a question. Yeah, yeah. So hold on a second. Here it'll come. Here it comes from Javier Rodriguez. Hello, Javier. Uh, can I ask what is the greatest single issues that each of you have read and why? Jeez, Javier, um, who I think might have worked with us at Forbidden Planet. If it is that Javier Rodriguez uh, knows that this question is mean. Um, greatest, greatest single issue, man, I don't know. Uh, one of my favorite single issues, and I couldn't say why it's one of my favorite single issues, is there's a, a Brubaker Daredevil issue that's just about the Kingpin, and it's about the Kingpin retiring and moving to Spain and falling in love with a woman, and then the hand shows up and kills the woman. And right. he returns, and it is just this amazing 
crime comic told in 20, 20 pages that is so full of like it reinvents who the character is and his motivations and every reframes him in this way and then you 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 see him as this gentle figure and this beautiful figure and this tragic figure and then through that tragedy he becomes even more terrifying than he's ever been and that to me i remember reading that issue and being like yeah that's that's how you do that like that's that's how you take a character that i've known my whole life and make me look at them in a completely new way yeah um there's some of the amy race car issues of stray bullets are uh changed my life and just really blew me away um i don't know tyler tyler you talk uh i don't know i'm gonna go with I'll just say my first comic I ever read, uh, Teen Titans Spotlight number four featuring Nightwing. Uh, wow. It's the, it's the first comic I ever read. So to me, it was the greatest comic ever because it was the only comic I had ever read. Um, but it was uh, to that point. But it was, it was a really good issue, actually. It's the first issue. Uh, Nightwing returns to uh, Wayne Manor because Batman's gone missing and Alfred can't find him. And he he's sort of talking about having Jamis Vu uh, about returning. You know, it's a place that he knows he's been his whole life, but it feels like he's never been there. And it's him wrestling with the idea of um, sitting out on his own to try and become his own man as opposed to the, the child soldier that Bruce Wayne tried to turn him into. And, uh, or, I don't know, uh, Optic Nerve number... 13. That was a good issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, you know, actually, a bigger one for me is the silent issue of G.I. Joe. Hmm. Um, hmm. I'd never seen anything like that. Uh, yeah. it, it blew my mind. And I, you know, every few years I revisit it to be like, it's not as good as I think it is. And it's like, no, it is as good. It's perfect. And I only recently was told, and I don't know if it's true, and I didn't bother to look into it, that the reason the issue is silent is because it was running late and they had to didn't have time to FedEx the pages to a letterer. And so they were like, yeah, we can just do it like this. And I was like, I don't know if that's true. It's sort of heartbreaking. It's sort of amazing. I don't know if it makes me like it more or less, but I don't want to find out if it's true. I just want to like have that off to the side. But the silent issue of G.I. Joe was a real mind blower for me. Well if it's if it's not true, it should be. Thank you, Javier, for that nerdy ass question. That was a that was a nerdy ass question. Uh, I love it though. Um, Okay, so uh, so yeah, we've oh, God, we've been talking for two hours. I kind of can't believe this. Um, uh, let me ask, let me ask one more question that I I wanted to ask you about the business end of the book uh, and about the goddamn records. Yep. Can we talk about the goddamn uh, records, please? Sure. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but you kind of knew. <laughs> You kind of knew that we weren't, we couldn't have this conversation if we didn't talk about the records and how it's been, you know, from the retailer side, a complete clusterfuck. Um, we've only sure. had the first printings of one and two delivered so far. Yeah. Um, we still haven't gotten any of the second printings. So, you know, we're, we're ordering eight of them at this point, I want to say, where we don't even know if those customers still want them because sure. we've. We've never been, had a chance to try. Um, obviously, I know that that the vinyl record there's a pipeline issues. I, I get the mechanical reasons of it. I guess the top question would be: Would you do this again? Fuck no. <laughs> um, no, I have I have about one hundred and thirty thousand dollars worth of credit card debt from this right now. Wow, Jesus, uh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not great. Um, and but the plus side is if they all come out and sell, I make zero dollars because we're giving all the money to charity. So there's a good right. risk reward. <laughs> yeah, 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 um, yeah. The uh, no, you know, here's the thing: we wanted to do it. Um, we we went out. We talked to Image about it. We talked to record distributors. We talked to the bands. We talked to their management. We talked to their labels. We talked to record stores. We picked numbers. We knew we had to do it far in advance. Um, we picked numbers for records for production that seemed on the high end, but still a collectible. There was a difficulty early on because basically we went, okay, we're going to make it a limited edition 
um, the first thing we were going to do is make it an unlockable incentive to be like, you have to order 10 copies of the book and then you can order a record. That seemed to be the easiest for a limited edition item. Um, Diamond got spooked because they said, what happens if the orders come in higher than the records? And I said, I don't know. You just lock it. And they said, we can't do that. We don't have a system for locking captains for incentives. So we can't have a system where store orders 100 copies thinking they're getting 10 records. And you're like, we just don't have that many. Then we have a problem because the stores have ordered a thing. And we thought that was a system that would work. So we said, OK, so we're just going to make them a crazy high incentive. That is, you're just going to have to order a ton of books to get them. Uh, and then we talked to some retailers who were like, if you do that, the way that the incentive system works is that we price it based on what we had to spend to get it. So you're going to have these records going out the door for a hundred bucks. If it's, you have to order a hundred books. And I was like, well, that can't be, these are records. Like these are, we want people to have these. So our final solution for this was, we're just going to print more than there we need. We're going to print 4,000 copies of these seven inches. That seemed high. The bands all agreed like, yeah, that's a really good number. It was fine. Uh, 4,000 was a good number. And then as we approached FOC, we were fine. Uh, image told us that there's a chance that we would just dip over 4,000. I said, okay, that will suck, but whatever. And then Diamond wanted to send out an allocation notice. And I said, doesn't that send everyone into a panic? And didn't really get an answer from them. They sent out an allocation notice. And the orders went from, I think, 3,600 to 16,000. Uh, and I had stores emailing me, I want to get five of these, so I ordered 50. I want to get 10, so I ordered 200. That just broke the system. Mm -hmm. um, people panicked. Diamond got very anxious. And I said, it's a limited edition item. They're getting allocated. That's just how it works. We actually gave up our comps. Uh, the bands gave up their comps. Image staff gave up their comps to make sure the stores could get their copies as best we could. We were nowhere near demand. And at a certain point, we were told, you need to do reprints on these. And I was like, you're getting in the back of a queue that we've been in for a year to get to here. We can't do that. And we were sort of told, like, you have to. Retailers are so upset and so mad about not having enough that you need to do that. So we said it's going to take a really long time and a lot of money. Um, and then they were like, yeah, go for it. So we started re-FOC for these reprints saying we don't know when they'll come. We can't get deadlines. Like when I used to press records, it was about a three-month turnaround for seven inches. Um, there was a point last year where I was getting told it was 15 months. Uh, turnaround time. There are multiple pressing plants who were just like, we're not taking new clients. We can't get, we can't get vinyl. Um, we can't get any part of the process to make records, so we can't take on orders. Um, the people who press the first record, who are the largest record manufacturer in the country, added a one dollar fifty cent surcharge per record for the reprints, and I was like, I can't afford that. That's over our margin. Um, so. What we did, we made a conscious decision when we were FOCing these reprints is to increase the initial prints. And so they're kind of gang running them together. They're not totally. So when we knew the reprints were coming, we were adding quantity to be like, well, we know what the FOC number is. And that moves us back in the queue because we've added quantity. And they're like, we don't have that vinyl allocated. So we didn't lose our spot in the queue. Right. But it would be we'd be giving everyone one per store and then they'd be waiting 15 months. And we made the decision to give everyone their whole order, but wait nine months uh, mm -hmm. or eight months for that. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's just complicated math. We were getting pulled in 10 different directions and, you know, we're talking to these bands and like, you know, one of the bands who's on the second record, I told them like, yeah, we're reprinting it before it's even out. And they were like, why, how many did you press the first time? And I said, we pressed 4,000 and they were like, why would you reprint that? And I said, because we have 9,000 more orders. And the band was just like, what are you talking about? Like, they couldn't understand. Like, I've had record labels calling me being like, how are you selling so many records? Why is this happening? And it's because stores are ordering very aggressively because they're speculating on it. And I get that. But they've, it's all created a feeding frenzy that we can't meet.
Yeah, I mean, well, it's also, I mean, let's let's be realistic, right? Like, if there's if, if there's three thousand comic shops and every comic shop has five customers who wants it, that's fifteen thousand copies right there. Sure. Right. Like, but, that's just that's like no that 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 even if no one's ordering speculatively, it it's still a magnitude higher than you thought it was going to be. Yeah, but nobody thought that every comic shop would want five copies. Sure. Like no one in there, you know I. Uh, you know, I don't want to tell tales out of school, but I went to some of the largest comic shops in the world and said, how many would you want? And I, one of them told me 10. And then when their orders came in, they ordered 1,100. Right. right. Um, and like I have the email that says, we want 10. And I have the order, the FOC, that's 1,100. And that happened right. across the board. I had shops, you know, in Europe and in other pl- everywhere being like, we would take three. And then mm-hmm. when the time came to order it, they were like, oh, we ordered 450. And it's yeah. like, well, you know, you kind of need to tell us that. Like, you were our sounding board as these various industry leaders of what you could do. Right. And we were talking, you know, like, we talked to, you know, Joyce Manor are on Epitaph Records. It's the largest independent record label in the world. We asked for their advice on what to press. Mm-hmm. And they said 2,000. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. You know, like, it, it, it's a little... But again, 2,000 wouldn't even be one per store at that but point. Why, but you know? not every store is ordering our book. Why would they order the yeah. record? Yeah. Like... We definitely didn't sell to, to 2,000 stores on the book. I have the spreadsheet. We didn't sell to 2,000 stores. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, some stores are going to order five or 10 in Cool City. Some stores are like, why would we order a record? For sure. Mm-hmm. I mean, I talked to stores who were like, I don't want to carry records. No, thank you. Mm-hmm. Guess what? That store ended up ordering 45. Sure. Um, so, you know, there was, but also, yeah, there's limited edition items that are one per store. They're two per store. We, we, we definitely came in lower than we thought. But actually, before the allocation notice came out, we were about where we needed to be and it would be a a sought after item. It would be a sort of rare item, which is not unusual in comics Mm -hmm. to have an item that is like Mm -hmm. kind of hard to get. Not everybody can get the black and white Jim Lee sketch cover of a book, but not everybody freaks out that they can't get it. They're like, that's hard to get and rare and my store can't get it and we only got one or whatever. That's not unusual in comics. Um, yeah, I mean these these days though, then it immediately becomes a hundred and fifty dollar book. You know, for sure. uh, I yeah. mean, look, you know, the one I would point to is that Frank Miller ash can that came out this week. Yeah, yeah. You know, with the one dollar cover price, it's selling for thirty dollars on eBay. Of yeah, course it is, because every store got four. Yeah. It, you, there's no nothing you can do with that in in the right way, just as a math problem. You know, for sure, for sure. I mean, we wanted to make a limited edition cool item that yeah. would appeal to some people and the and people got more excited than we thought and i think some of that was you know pandemic buying and hype and some of it's speculation and some of it is miscalculation on our parts and other people's parts um but at the end of the day it's you know we're trying to make everything and fill the orders the records are still going for 70 and 80 bucks on ebay regularly so like you know i had a store I mean, I've had stores curse me out every single week since this started. Like, not an exaggeration. I get emails of people just fully cursing me out. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I had a store curse me out and be like, I couldn't get this. You know, like, I only got one of this. I needed three and cursed me out. And I looked and the store ordered 10. They got one. And lo and behold, look at that. They had an eBay account. And I looked at their eBay account and they sold the one they got for $160. Right, and so right, I emailed right. them back and was like, hey, you tried to order $75 worth of product with a suggested retail price of $15. So you would have made $75. Yeah. You ended up getting $7.50 worth of product and making $150. Yeah. And you cursed me out for it. And when you tell me I needed three for my customers, I know you didn't give it to your customer, right? You right. put it on eBay. So like, right. I don't know what you want from me exactly. Like we made a rare item. A lot of you made a lot of money putting it on eBay. A lot of you had frustrated, frustrated customers. They're going to get their records or they won't. Like it's, it's very complicated. It's very difficult. It's super not fun for charities and the bands and all these things. But we are trying to do it. The third record has been at Diamond since May. What? It's been a diamond really? since May, late what, May. What are they doing with it? I'm not sure. Um, they they have to collate them and put them together. They're not shipping it. Um, you also you you know I'm sure you do know that they they shipped us the comics for I want to say five and six without the records. Well, which is like, like what the hell am I supposed to do with this? Yeah, we don't know what we're doing with that because obviously we paid to print all the books. 
Yeah. So they're sitting in a warehouse. We've paid for them already. Yeah. Um, because we can't reprint books at Image. Image has a no reprint rule. So we had to print the books which is, as the which books is, came out. Which is a ridiculous rule. Oh my God. I mean, it's hard to get paper and they're having yeah. trouble. I mean, everyone's having sure. trouble. It's it's not it's not an ideal time to be making things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so we're we're trying to get it, and Image has been amazing in trying to deal with this. Uh, there was a a leadership change over there, so the person who was in charge of this left, and it fell in a bunch of other people's laps. And I feel really terrible for them, but Alex Cox and and Cat and all of them have been doing an amazing job of trying to manage this. Theoretically, every record is going to be in in Diamond's hands by the end of the year. Uh, theoretically changes a lot <laughs> but mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. we you know i could show you i have the test pressings of every record right over there so like mm -hmm. they're manufactured we're just waiting for space on the machines and we have been for months like i you know mm -hmm. the, tyler's heard all the test pressings i've listened to them they're approved i mean one of the the test pressing for three we rejected and they had to make new plates for and we wow. it's still been at diamond for two months and the reprint is going to be ready soon and it is a is slow this, process. Is that the one that they sent us on the glow in the dark one? Yeah, <laughs> they sent us test pressings on a, on a glow in the dark, and glow in the dark, the the material that makes it glow pops yeah. on vinyl, and it's a very yeah. quiet record. They cover a big one of the bands covers a Big Star song, and it's just piano yeah. and vocals. And I was just listening to it, and I was like, it sounds like someone is firing a gun in the background. Like, what is happening? <laughs> yeah. And then I called the pressing plant and was like, why? This sounds awful. And they were like, well, it's on glow in the dark. And I was like okay, why did you send that to me? And they're like, that was what was on the machine. And I was like, I can't approve this. It, it sounds terrible. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, well, just imagine that it sounds good. And I was like, isn't the point of this <laughs> just to know that it sounds good, not to guess that it might sound good? And so they had to make they, they had to make us new ones. And I was like, these sound great, go. And they were definitely mad, but you know, what can you do? Yeah, yeah we have orders at orders out at four different pressing plants. Um, we had We had orders at six, one of them, uh, refunded our money and said, we can't get you records. We can't in good conscience sit on your money. And one of them added uh, $11,000 to our invoice. And we were like, no, you can't do that. So we got our money back and moved the record. Um, it is a very, I mean, I, I regularly field calls from record labels being like, how are you getting these records in time? Like mm -hmm. there, I have friends who run record labels who like, I mean, I have friends who run record labels who went out of business during the pandemic because they're like, we can't make product. But yeah. there are bands who are canceling tours because they can't get records and right. and all sorts of things. So it, it is not. We waded into something that was in full collapse, and at the same time, people it, it wasn't in collapse yet. yet. Yeah, we waded mm. in right as it was going into collapse, right. and you know that's why the first record came out on time and the second record came out reasonably on time, and uh, since then, not so much. And yeah. you know, we have we have more songs. We have more songs. We could have done more records. We just stopped because we were like, "This is a nightmare. We can't keep doing this." Yeah. So like, yeah. there are bands who recorded, and we were like, "Yeah, I don't know what to tell you. We can't do this." So um, ultimately, we'll have figured out by the end of all this. We'll have figured out all of the uh, terrible and pitfalls of it, and have a streamlined way in which you probably could do the records, but we we will not be doing that. Somebody yeah, else never can. never doing that again. Yeah. <laughs> The, the, the stunt of it, I mean, it, you know, at the end of the day, I'm happy if the records sell and if stores are comfortable with them, um, that'll be great. I'm trying to figure out a way to make sure stores are comfortable with them. The audience, I think, is there. I think that stores will sell them when they get them. Uh, and and we'll have raised a bunch of money for charity and made a cool thing. And yeah. that is my, my, my 2023, end of 2023, where I calm down and say, I'm not, I'm not six digits in debt. We sure. raised money for charity. People got the things they want. Stores made money on it. That is my goal. But until then, yeah, it's just sort of nightmare ulcer territory. Yeah, yeah. Well, especially because, you know, we just, uh, we're not used to periodicals that don't come out periodically, uh, essentially, sure. you know. And yeah. and from our point of view, it's a periodical, you know. Yeah, yeah. People signed up for in the way that people sign up for periodicals. You yeah, know? I mean, that's that's um, the funny thing is that, like, you know, there are a bunch of stores that are comic shop slash record stores. Yeah. And when we would talk to them, they'd be like, oh, yeah, you're fine. Because the record stores and the record buying audience knows that, like, there aren't dates on these things anymore. Sure, They're sure, used sure, to sure. be. Sure. And now it's, 
when it comes in, you can have it. Like, we'll let yeah. you know. And so yeah. they don't, but obviously the comic audience is very different. And so comic yeah. fans are like, how do I get this? How do I get this? And yeah. comic shops are pulling their hair out and we're like, we don't have answers for you. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, I've, I've had people, I've had customers curse me out thinking it was that I was cheating them somehow, you yeah, know, yeah. that I, that I was holding back the copies. Like, why would I do that? Yeah. I want you to get the thing that you want. Why would I not want that? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm sorry. Uh, it's all good. It's I just I had to bring it up. I I knew that people would not would expect me to do so, so I brought it up. Yeah. And and we've had the conversation. So <laughs> very yeah, good. Uh, there's more of these. You said I think you're shooting for thirty. Is that is that right? Sorry, is that 30, five 30. volumes or so? I think it's it's either six or seven volumes. Yeah, some of the way ones are breaking smaller down. Smaller because they're oversized issues, but shorter, but less of them. Okay. Yeah. Some of the some of the fill in issues because Tyler's less constrained. We made longer because we can give people more time. So the 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 fill in issue volumes are going to be four issues, but still be well over a hundred pages. Be yeah. 130, 140 pages. Yeah. Great. Yeah. No, I'm looking forward to that. I uh, I. I can't wait to see more, honestly. Thank you. Um, uh, oh, I know what I wanted to ask you that I totally forgot to ask. The, the, the chapters and the nature of the chapters being a variable length mm -hmm. and, and being sort of hooked around, you know, one line. Yeah, um, yeah. What, was the, what was the thinking and the process of, of doing that? Um. Well, I think the, the chapter is an interesting thing. I have one, one. It sort of comes from me on a on a pet peeve of mine, which is non logical. But I don't like when a scene ends and the next scene begins with the same characters. I don't. I think it's. I think it's inelegant to do that. Um, mm -hmm. It's very common. No one else seems to think it's inelegant. It's just a weird hang up of mine. Mm -hmm. And because of the nature of our book when it started. Uh, you were always with the same five people. So it was right. impossible that, you know, it starts in a room, goes to a building, goes to the block, goes to a few mm -hmm. blocks out. We were mm -hmm. always going to be with the same cast. We would never mm -hmm. cut away from them. So that was, at, at first, it was an idea I played with for that, to break it up. But also, I think some of it is about just letting the audience know that um, this isn't a race. I think a lot of comics are built on the idea of going full speed all the time. And we think there's a lot of value in atmosphere and in catching your breath and in and stopping to think on things. Mm -hmm. And um, we wanted to build that into the book and not just be like, you can catch your breath every 20 pages or 22 pages, but be like, when something matters, you're going to have a moment to think on it and to reflect mm -hmm. and, and just sort of rearrange the way people approach a periodical comic. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. It doesn't cost us very much more. It costs us, you know, fractions of a cent to do it. But it, uh, you know, we played around with it. We didn't have it at first. And then we started playing with it and build up and mock ups of the book. And we found that the reading experience was just a little more elegant in that way. It was a little, it felt a little less rushed and a little more pointing towards the things we wanted you to appreciate, which was a, a slow build and a slow burn and a slow release of information and and just telling you to take your time with this like um there's speed bumps uh there's speed bumps to make you look at the scenery if, if that mm -hmm. makes sense and so, yeah that does make a lot of sense um that that was a lot of it and then and then we sort of fell in love with it because it allowed us to do all sorts of fun weird things of like you know they start to play with you know the, it's always quotes from the upcoming scene but what those quotes are we can play with them and what they mean and it allows us to do things about playing with where page turns are and and things like that so it it, it very much uh plays with all that and then we hit the moment of calling them chapters which we thought was really funny at first but we really sort of started to fall in love with because we think of this as an epic where it goes where it's headed is is this expansive big thing and so like so many comics like i, I feel like i'm banging this drum a lot but so many comics when they're an epic, they tell you from page one, this is an epic. Mm -hmm. And we didn't want to tell you that. We wanted to ease you into it. And so the calling them chapters gives that sense that we're building towards something big and epic. And it has that Tolkien-esque feel. And like we made a map for the same reason. Mm -hmm. um, and I think all of those things are sort of subtle 
ways to just be like, let's just approach this a little differently than than you do a lot of your other books. That's that was our goal. Is this is this punitive thirty issues? Uh, and that's not necessarily the hard number, but uh, is is that enough to tell all of the story that you want to tell? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the world is rich, and we would you know love the idea of playing with it. But I yeah. think that the story we want to tell is that story. And if you know, I mean, we already know what the book we're doing next is, so. Um, Great. You know, it's not like we're 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 going to desperately cling to something because it's working. Mm -hmm. And you know, that was a big thing with us with four kids. When four kids was successful, Matt Pizzolo from Black Mass called us and was like, "This is selling really well. You can keep going." And we were like, "Oh, what would it be?" And we played with that idea. And then we were like, "No, we know what the ending is. Like, mm -hmm. I, I I love having a successful book and having people love it. And I I would love to try and keep it going. But like, that's dishonest. We have an ending, and we know what that is, and we need to get there." Yeah. Um, and this is that too. The ending is just further away. So the, that thirty ish number is is where we always set out to be. And not um, always. Not, not we always. Had, we we added five at one point because we we thought we could get there yeah. in a shorter number, and then we realized, oh crap, we'd be we we'd be rushed. So, oh. Yeah, there was a there was a thing that we were like, this this carries more weight than we thought, and we'd be rushing through it, and it's really actually important and emotional. Yeah, and it and it needs its own arc. Um, let me so. let me ask a question between the. I mean, obviously, story is, as you say, uh, a character changes through the story, right? Sure. As as a result of the story, but there's also there's also a science fiction level to this world, right? Where mm -hmm. where the audience, I think, is going to want you know sort of yeah, an sure. explanation of some of the things that are going on. Yeah. Are are both of those things um, accounted for, it, yes. as far as you can tell? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's it's a complicated answer because there are things we very much, you know, one of uh, some of the stuff we look to, um, we look to a lot of television actually, um, but things like Twin Peaks, um, The Leftovers, Lost, things like that, that the mystery is propul as propulsive as any other part of it. Um, the character journeys are as, as much the driving engine as as getting answers. And we really weighed that. And I think some of what we have is we know why the world is the way it is. And we know how it got there. We have all of that. We've always had all of that. Um, how much we want to give the audience, we go back and forth on. Um, there is obviously you can't string an audience along for 30 issues and not tell them anything. Sure. You have to give them information in bits and pieces. We want to give them that information when it matters, um, when it hits the hardest, and when they are at the point when they think they need it. And so that's the game we're playing. But there's some bits of information. You know, a funny thing is, like, people are always like, well, Sid is pregnant. When are we going to find out who the father is? And um, we know who the father is. But, like, I don't know that we're going to say. We may. Uh -huh. But that wasn't what the story is about. It's not sure. important to her journey. Sure. Um, she's on her own, and it's not her journey. And and like, some of that is also building the idea that these are children exploring a world that ended long before they were alive. Mm -hmm. You don't always get answers. You don't mm -hmm. find out. Like, I don't know why the Roman Empire collapsed. I have sure. hints and pieces, and I have historians tell me, but I don't know for sure that that's true. There's a lot of things that are lost to time, and so some of what we give you will be true and some of what we give you won't be true and we will later disprove some of what we give you and and a, a lot of that is just about the flow of information and how it would work in the real in this world if it were real mm -hmm. and we don't sure. want to give people there's an early version of the book that we made that had narration that had caption boxes that explained mm -hmm. what happened and why and mm -hmm. we just it just sucked it was just mm -hmm. terrible there was no reason mm -hmm. to do it mm -hmm. um we took it all out and we said, you know, the, while these kids explore the world, our audience is going to explore the world and we're going to explore the world. Sure. And we're going to do it together and it's our journey together. And you come along for it or you don't. Um, yeah. But yes, there are answers. It's not just a weird, yeah. wh what, I, is this, uh, what is this I, land? I, I, I only ask because you gave three examples there at the beginning and at least one of those three, like, never answered any of its own questions. And sure, of like, course disappointed everyone as a result you of know? course uh yeah. i have i have compli very complicated feelings about that show um yeah. the 
but I love wholeheartedly the journey it took me on. Sure, and I sure. un, un, unapologetically love the journey it took me on. And so There's some no of mystery the, boxes for the sake of mystery boxes. Yeah. So we're not doing that. We're right. trying to make that journey and that there are answers. Um, and I think the answers are rewarding. And I think, you know, in the flashback issues, we try to give you little bits of answers. And mm -hmm. like some of them are small answers, but some of them are very big answers. And you're going to yeah. see going forward, especially in eight and nine, little pieces of things that you didn't understand that really answer a lot of questions. And then 10, when Tyler comes back, we turn a lot of the things you know up on their head. Like we're yeah. kind of reinvent the book every, yeah. every eight issues um, by nice. design. So, nice. yeah. Uh, a lot of the book is centered around the the families and the various families uh, that the, the kids are. It, it, given that you have, you know, a relatively finite length of this story, were there any families that you guys thought up that you're you just you're not going to be able to use at all? No, we I need. Know. I feel like we eventually will use everyone. Maybe okay. I don't. There's certain things that we come up with. There, like, for instance, there's this whole thing that I came up with in issue eight in a phone call. Not I, me and Matt came up with in a phone call. Um, of this whole backstory of these two different families that I don't know will ever be explained. Like, there's mm -hmm. all these things where it's like, and it's mm -hmm. like, it's, there's a family that may only ever be in one panel. Yeah. Um, but I'm, okay. so I'm, I don't know. I'm curious what all. What are you talking? Oh, I know what you're talking about. You're the, talking about the two families the that are the same. The, the two families that are the same and they live in uh... warring monarchies of there's two families coming up who live in uh, competing sex toy shops in their town mm -hmm. nice. and uh, they're basically <laughs> ruling they're basically weird monarchies that uh -huh. are not yeah. compatible um, yeah so yeah there's a there's a there's a reason that there are two different sex toy <laughs> shops we have a logic to that uh, yeah. which I, I enjoy but yeah uh -huh. no there isn't anything. I don't think there's anything that we haven't. There have been ones that haven't quite worked, but they're back on the drawing boards because we still need more. You're going to keep discovering the world gets bigger and weirder, um, and then at a certain at issue 19 or so, the world tips on its head in a weird way where it's going to be very different. But uh, maybe that's 20. I I, I can't wait to see. I I really can't. Uh, I. Uh... I really, really love this book a lot, um, Thank you. and I, I think it is done with passion and it is done with craft, and it's kind of beautiful. And yeah, I, I just you're, you're going to make it all the way. You're going to make it all the way to the end, and that's going to be great. And then, then yeah, this is good stuff, man. Thank you. Thank you. That means a lot coming from you. That really does. Like, yeah. uh, I, I know that you know, from the first time I, I signed in your shop uh years ago for we can never go home it was a it was a a place that people talked about with great reverence and and your championing of the stuff that i do and and we do has always meant more than just someone being being supportive it's always meant a sort of seal of approval that that means really a lot to us both well thank you thank you i i mean i think i'm just i'm just another comic shop honestly but uh i do i do appreciate that i do appreciate that uh that feeling um the last question we always wrap everything up because we sort of ask the what's next um though you you already know what your next book is huh you the next yeah. thing you guys are gonna do uh, well 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 there's two there's a two-part answer to that that i think yes we know what the next two things are they're very different yeah. from each other is that okay. fair to say tyler yeah, I was just, I think in, for this place will be going on for a year and a half, um, uh, or at least the next year and a half, I think. And I think the next book that we do together will be coming out at the same time. Yeah. It's a complicated one. You'll, we'll, we'll talk about that more soon. But nice, yeah, there's, nice. a, there's another thing coming out that will be coming out concurrently. And then are you, are you, you're not going to stay with, uh, with, with kid protagonists again, or uh, is it something, something different than that? Uh, it's a little different. There's some kids in it, though. We like kids. Okay. Uh, okay. We like kids because it means that when Hollywood studios call us, they're like, this is really hard to make, and we can laugh at them and be like, yeah, it's not our job to make your job easy. Sorry. <laughs> um, 
it's always a it's always a fun phone call for us. Yeah. Oh man. All right. So then the last question always is is what's your advice for people who want to make comics? You know, um, and enough time has passed. I think mm-hmm. you probably don't even remember what your answers were. You know, five years ago or whenever that was. Um, I'm, I'm sure your perspectives have has also changed. On yeah. At point, you know. <laughs> my my. my niece- answer- Oh, sorry, Matt. Go no, go, Tyler. I was going to say, I, I was hanging out with my uh, 11-year-old um, niece uh, this past Sunday or Saturday, and she told me she wanted to be an artist. And so I, she, she came into my studio and she was like, how do you do what you do? And I was like showing her how, like in a fun way that I thought for kids how to do it in like mm-hmm. maybe about like a minute. Uh, mm-hmm. And I finished and I said, so yeah, that's kind of what it is. She goes, oh, that's really boring. And then she <laughs> left. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, i don't know that i have great advice <laughs> um, um, but what would be that advice tyler come on yeah yeah i i mean if i i think um it's it's a weird thing that i uh i, I don't think there's a lot of sport you don't see a lot of sports fans crossovers with uh comics fans um but it's a thing i hear a lot about in the it's a thing that's said a lot about in professional athletes and football players and things which is uh be yourself um don't try to be anybody else uh, I think that's really important. Uh, making comics. Look at that. That's that could be on a T-shirt. That could be on a yeah. tote bag. That's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Um, my advice: I have uh, uh, what sounds like very cutthroat advice, um, which is save money. Um, mm-hmm. And I I know that that comes as a very like, oh yeah, being an artist is hard. I'm coming from a place of someone who doesn't know how to draw. So my entire comics creation ability is dependent on other people. Mm-hmm. Um, You're welcome. Artists, <laughs> thank you, Tyler. Uh, artists are people who need to eat and pay bills, and it takes yeah. them a lot longer to draw a comic than it takes me to write it. Yeah. Um, the easiest way to get someone to realize that you have vision and passion and are worth talking to is by showing them that you are serious about what you do, and that comes from being able to pay them for their time. Yeah, And uh, I know it sounds callous, but when I started doing this, you know, I, I had a good job and I collected records and I played video games and I bought Star Wars toys. And I just hit a point where I was like, I got to stop all that. That's spending money that could be going to paying good artists to give me the time of day and work on pitches and work on art. And when you start making comics, it's okay to have a day job. It's great to have a day job and make comics. But uh you need to have money to pay for things and you need to if you want to make this as a living you need to be able to live lean um for for a long time i don't want to give the speech where no one makes com- money in comics that's not true people make very good money in comics Some people um, do. it is a it can be a great living and a great job but uh as a struggling starting artist it is tough and you need to be used to eating uh, ramen five nights yeah. a week and you need to be okay with peanut butter sandwiches and not going to see the movie when it comes out in theaters and not play the new video game and if it's your passion that's the best advice I have is like if this is really what you want to do for a living you're going to be willing to sacrifice some things to make sure that it's easier for you to do it um, yeah. that's, if a very, can... that's a very uh, uh, eyes wide open uh, 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 thing I, I like that I, like the, I don't think I've heard uh, that answer before is is that part of the reason that Tyler's name is is first on the book? Uh, no, I always put artist names first when I get the choice, but also uh, it's alphabetical. Boss mm. comes before Rosenberg, okay. so if if Tyler starts to feel important, I can be like it's alphabetical. <laughs> but uh, it, uh, otherwise, no, I just always put the artist name yeah. first. I don't, I don't. It's a funny thing in comics that people really care, and it's a thing I could care. I like. I don't care if my name's not on it. I I. My first Star Wars comic uh, that I ever wrote, uh, Star Wars, my favorite film of all time. I got to write a Star Wars comic as my dream come true. Marvel forgot to put my name on it. Uh, and I got a like very apologetic phone call. And I was like, oh, that's fine. Whatever. I know I wrote it. I don't care. Yeah. Um, there, there's just no writing credit on the book, which is amazing and hilarious to me. But they were very mortified. And uh, I was like, yeah, it's not that important, guys. It's, I write it because I want to write it, not because I want to see my name on it. So Nice. Nice. I like that. I like that. And as I said, I like this book. I, um, I thank you for, for making the book. Uh, you put, put me on the one, Ben. Um, uh, I, it, if you're sitting at home, 
as many of us are doing when you don't really have, you don't know what to read next. And that's still a thing, even at this point in the pandemic. Um, uh, this is a great piece of science fiction. It's a great piece of people finding their way in the world, of finding out what their world is and, and how they exist. And it's, I don't know, it's a human work. That's, that's the best thing you can say about a piece of science fiction is that it, it shows you something about humanity and, and about how we are and who we are. So I think it's wonderful. Um, so buy it. If you, if you were to buy it from us, you would also get um, a book plate, um, a signed book plate. Cool, right? So you can do that as well. You can buy it from, uh, from us uh, and do that if you wanted to. Um, I want to, uh, I want to thank, um, I want to thank Ben for running the show, running the camera. Uh, I want to thank Jordan, uh, who's our producer, who does, does all the backstage stuff, including well, these are now about to be, um, um, uh, a podcast very soon. So that, that's also thanks to Jordan. I want to thank my staff, um, Kat and Zoe and uh, Katie, who I wouldn't be able to do this if it wasn't for these people. Um, I want to thank uh, I want to thank all the members of the club. I want to thank everybody who's watching this at home or listening to it or seeing it. Join the club, make us some money. This is how it works. And I especially want to thank um, uh, Tyler and Matthew. Uh, and it looks like Matthew disappeared. So, bye, Matthew, jerk. Um, <laughs> there you go. Matthew's back. Yay. Okay. Because I had just literally just gotten to the point where I had thanked everybody. And now I circled back to thank you guys for making comics. Because if you guys didn't make comics, I wouldn't have anything to sell. And and I would be causing trouble in somewhere else. And I'd much rather be causing trouble for comics because, you know, that's 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 honest trouble, I guess. Um, anyway, thank you for, for making a book like this. Thank you for participating and being here with us and spending time with us and, and, you know, sitting through all my dumbass questions and, you know, thank you guys. No, thank, thank you. you. And thanks, thanks, thanks to everyone um, for watching and, and thanks to everyone in the book club for, for being the kind of reader who wants to just explore new things. Like we couldn't do our jobs if it weren't for people who like trying new stuff. So thank you all sincerely. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, very good. Oh, wait, next time. Hold on. Before we before we go away completely, uh, next month's book, it's also an image book. How's that happen? Oh. Uh, we're going to do Ghost Cage. Um, we got Nick Dragata and uh, Caleb. I don't, I'm going to mispronounce this. Golner, I think. We'll, we'll find out next month. That's next month's book. Uh, the next month's kids book is this little ditty called Expedition Backyard. Really cute and charming. Um, Rosemary Mosco and Binglin Hugh. Um, that's going to be our next kids book, uh, for September. So look for those shows, um, really soon in a month. Um, we will see you next time. Thank you so much for being a part of the comics experience graphic novel club. Thank you for watching this episode of the graphic novel of the month club. If you enjoyed what you were watching, please, uh, subscribe and hit that bell up in the top corner. If you enjoyed the books that we're talking about and the creators that we're talking to every month, we pick a brand new book. Uh, the staff votes on it. It's a program that helps keep our store alive, and we'd love to have you as a member. You'll get a new book every month. Just follow that URL at the bottom of the screen.